I'm awake now. He has that effect on people. Okay. Um, yeah. As before we we jump into content this morning, I, I want to show you a few things because we have had a number of questions about it. <clears throat> Best place to get the books is Amazon.com. I, I need to, you know, it, it's I don't know who's read what here, so I, I should explain the relationship between Unseen Realm and Supernatural. This is Unseen Realm. This is the academic book. This is the one with lots of footnotes and bunny trails and all that kind of stuff to sources. Um, I, would, I recommend this for someone who has, you know, uh, a decent amount of experience reading scripture, you know, some Bible under your belt is how I like to say it. Uh, and if you're used to reading books with footnotes, you'll do just fine. I had a really good editor. It's very readable. Um, I've got over 800 reviews. Read the reviews. When people aren't like, you know, I can't read this. I can't under. It's not like that at all. Even though it's it's an academic book, uh, I wouldn't call it a scholarly book because it's actually intelligible. Okay, <laughs> most scholars can't can't write to save their lives. You know, they they they, uh, they they write for themselves. The other members of the guild. Now, supernatural is the light l i t e version of unseen realm. No footnotes. No argumentation. In fact, those were my instructions. Like when, when we we had our first meeting about taking the risk to publish Unseen Realm, because what I did, I don't know if anybody has followed my work more than five years or so, but I was working on the book that would become Unseen Realm for about 15 years. It was a putter project. Um, five minutes here, half an hour there, I would you know work through it. Because when I when I was deep into my dissertation, I had sort of a not an epiphany, but a, a, a conviction, convicting moment. I'm sitting in the in Memorial Library at the University of Wisconsin, just enjoying the fact that <clears throat> I was rediscovering scripture as a doctoral student. Just because of Psalm 82 and, and making the decision that I, was, that I was gonna allow scripture to speak for itself, and I was not gonna be afraid of the supernatural worldview of the writers. And I'm sitting there just enjoying it, and, the, and I was struck by the thought you know, 95, maybe even higher, you know, maybe 99% of people who care about the Bible in church will never see this stuff. Because I'm going through the academic literature and whatnot. And I, and I thought, you know, I could do that. I could take all this dense material and all this old material that's going to feel really new to people, you know, having essentially walked that path uh, for the, you know, the previous couple of years, I can do that. You know, I, I can I can make this digestible and, and comprehensible, and that's what I should do. And so that's sort of where the unseen unseen realm. I, I my first draft I called it the myth that was the myth that is true. Um, and so I began work on this, and it became a putter project because I had to work on my dissertation. Since I burned my first year writing a novel, I didn't want to work on my dissertation. <laughs> Uh, so I, I was under pressure to, to finish the thing. And then I got hired at, at Logos, and it, it's not a teaching job, so I didn't have summers off. You know, it was just, you, you just poke away at it. And I put it, when I finished the draft, I just put it online for free because I figured no evangelical publisher would publish it. And that's just sort of the way it was. So when, when Lexum, you know, which, is a, which was a print imprint of my employer at the time. It was a couple years old. We decided to go into print. And we published some things and had success. And then my, my boss wanted to do this, which is a, a funny story, but I won't digress here. Um, everybody in the room said, we're going to do this, but you need to produce a, a light version of it. And here were my instructions. This is both funny and scary. They said, and, and we, we hired like this external group that launches books, you know, people who were in the industry for 20 years or more. Um, so they said, when you write this, because I had never written a popular book before. I'd written journal articles and academic stuff. They said, here are your instructions. No footnotes. Don't argue any point. You, know, you don't go back and forth. You don't do what academics do. Just say it and they'll believe it. They actually said that. And I looked at them and I thought, you know, that's, that I actually said, that's a little creepy. 
And, and the rationale was the average person who walks into a Christian bookstore, they're not interested in thinking deeply about content. They assume that if it's in the store, it's okay. So if you, if you write it, they will believe it. You know, it's like, oh, okay, you know, we'll try. <laughs> but, you know, I, I mean, I, at that point I had, a, I had a website, I had the, the other volume. It's like if people want information, they can get, you know, Supernatural is designed to, to just pull the core ideas. I wrote Unseen Realm first, and then I literally went through the book, pulled out major thoughts, put them in a Word doc, and it's like, okay, here's five chapters that are about 12,000 words. How do I make this 1,800 words? That was my method. Um, because each chapter couldn't be more than 1,800 words. So it was a challenge. Um, but if you, it, you would hand Supernatural to someone who's just the average person in church. Okay, I know there's this thing called the Bible. I'm interested in it. I'm a believer. I don't really know much about it. I haven't really read through it yet. I've read parts of it. That's the person you hand Supernatural to. Okay, if you're beyond that, and I'm, I, I'm thinking basically everybody in this room is, you could probably handle Unseen Realm just fine. But I have found a lot of people like to read both because after you've read Unseen Realm, or even before, Supernatural will feel like a nice summary. Okay? The other thing that, that I don't know why more people don't know about this, see if it's listed here in Amazon. Maybe that's why people don't know about it. They don't have it. Some pages they do. I've, I have yet to figure out the logic of Amazon. It's kind of hard when they don't have any humans there. Um, See, look at that. Oh, there it is. See, it has no results, but then it brings the book up. Yes. Doug, Doug Van Dorn is a pastor in Colorado, a friend of mine, and he had the idea to take the content of Unseen Realm and, and put it into a question-answer primer. And then I read through it. He and I only had like a couple, couple disagreements. And since it was based on my book and Lexham did it, you know, I, I won those battles. Um, but this is really nice. Now, now here, this will give you a little insight into not only my personality, but Doug's. There are 95 questions in the book. 95 theses, Luther, Reformation. That's our little inside dig. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's really handy. You know, if you want the content distilled in a few sentences at a time, and then you have verses that go with it and the occasional footnote, it's, it's really nice. Uh, people have asked about Enoch. Um, this is the translation I recommend because it's the most recent. And Nicholsburg and Vanderkam, um, they're both retired now, but they are experts in Second Temple Lit and specifically Enoch. This translation is derived from a two, that two-volume commentary on Enoch that I mentioned yesterday by Nicholsburg. Um, Vanderkam is a believer. He's in the Christian Reformed Church. Uh, you know, he has a, a, a testimony of faith in, in, in Jesus. I don't think Nicholsburg does. Um, Vanderkam taught for many years at Notre Dame, and Nicholsburg was at the University of Iowa. Um, and, and Nicholsburg, when he wrote the, his commentary on Enoch, he produced a fresh translation of the book, all 108 chapters, and then had Vanderkam partner with him to, to work, you know, rework the translation, and then the publisher stripped that out, and they published it in a little paperback, which is really nice. So this is the, the most up-to-date English translation of First Enoch. The other thing that the, the it, it supersedes chronologically. I, I don't know if I'll if I'll say in in, in terms of its you know quality because the other one that I'm going to mention here is high quality as well. It's just that this is this is cheap and it's just the just the translation. Uh, Charlesworth James Charlesworth who teaches still at Princeton um, has a two volume set on the Old Testament pseudepigrapha. In volume one, that's the volume that, that First Enoch is in. Um, Charlesworth's just the editor. The guy who did the translation of, of uh, First Enoch in Charlesworth's volume is Ephraim Isaac. He's an, an Ethiop. Well, he's he's from Ethiopia. He's an Ethiopic scholar, which uh, all 108 chapters uh, only exist in Ethiopic for First Enoch. There's a, there's a bunch that exist in Greek as well, and then some Aramaic fragments. But his translation lives in that first volume. That's a good translation. But, you know, that's going to be 40 or 50 bucks. This is 10 bucks. So that's why I recommend this one. 
Our, before we get to our subject today, some people <coughs> have, have asked or commented on Fringe Pop 321. This is my new YouTube channel. It's about two months old. And my my nonprofit, Miklat, that's M-I-Q-L-A-T dot org. It's a Hebrew term that means haven. Uh, we are partnering with allaboutgod.com, which is an, another nonprofit, to create uh, essentially an apologetics video channel. But but our what we're aimed at is is the weird fringe stuff on the internet, because I've I've been in this community since 2001, ancient alien stuff. You know, look at the first Constantine. Constantine picked the books that were in the New Testament, really. Uh, you know, so so we're we're pulling out all sorts of fringe topics. We have a really nice studio. You know, there's Bigfoot. Um, if you want to see, uh, oh, I don't want to play that yet, but here's the episode on Nibiru and Planet X. But I mean, we're doing all these fringe topics to, to basically inject some sanity into them. Um, so if you're interested in that kind of thing, you know, the Fringe Pop 321, please subscribe. Uh, it's, they're, they're, I mean, they're, they're good episodes. E each episode has a corresponding web page. The guy who runs allaboutgod.com made his living in SEO. How many of you know what SEO is? Search engine optimization for those who don't. We're two months old and we already, we already rank on the, on the first page of Google for hundreds of topics because he knows what he's doing. So our goal is to be for every fringe topic on the internet to be somewhere on the first page with either a web page or fringe pop episode. That's the goal. So we're... We're well down the path. Uh, Naked Bible Podcast. I actually did an episode on our topic today. So I, I sent the slides last night uh, to Terry. If you want the slides that you know I'm using uh, yesterday and today, he can give you a set of slides. It's fine. If you want to listen to a podcast episode on our topic today, this is the one. It's episode 109. So it's over 100 episodes ago. But I get this question so many times, I thought, we just need to do an episode of the podcast on it. So we did. But for this morning, we will go through the material here. So Jesus and Psalm 82. Again, I, I get this question all the time. Um, you know, and, and most of the time, I, I, there's two kinds of people that ask this question. There are the people who sincerely want information. Like, well, like what's, you know, what's going on in Psalm 82? You know, uh, and, and, you know, okay, there there's plural Elohim there, there's gods, but then, you know, Jesus quotes this passage, so like, what, why is he doing that? How does this work? That's one type of person. The other type of person thinks that Jesus' quotation of Psalm 82 undermines a supernatural, you know, reading of Psalm 82. In other words, undermines the way an Israelite would have looked at Psalm 82. That it proves that the gods of Psalm 82 are just men, because that's what Jesus is saying. You know, he's quoting it to the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are just men, so the gods of Psalm 82 must be men. Ha ha. You know, touche. Um, no. <laughs> so, you know, whether you, I don't know who, who's in what camp here, but it doesn't really matter because I think if you care about things like the deity of Christ and the consistency of John's testimony about Jesus you'll be interested in this. So here's John chapter 10. I'm just going to read through the passage just to get the, the flavor for it. At that time, the Feast of Dedication took place at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temple in the colonnade of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you and you don't believe. <laughs> what more do you need? You know, the works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. Interesting line, greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now, typically... You know, you'll, you'll get people that say, well, he, Jesus just means that he and the Father are on the same page, you know, about, you know, the believer. That isn't the way the Jews take it. And that's important. The Jews picked up stones again to stone him. <laughs> so they're not saying, oh, okay, we get it. You know, you agree with God here. And yeah, we agree with God on lots of things too, so it's okay. No, they're picking up, they're looking for, give me a big one, okay? They're looking for rocks to stone him. 
Jesus answered them, I've shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? That, that's one of my favorite lines in the gospel because I like sarcasm. You can probably tell. <laughs> but that's just the perfect line. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you being a man make yourself God. It's very clear how they are taking Jesus' statement. Okay, and, and that's important for what Jesus does in Psalm 82 and what he doesn't do with Psalm 82. And again, it's going to surprise you. We're, we're, I'll still use the word most, but I want to say basically all New Testament scholars, both in and outside of evangelicalism, will say that the gods are men in this passage and in Psalm 82. You know, in effect, you know, if, if that's what Jesus is saying, the Pharisees certainly don't think so. So why are we adopting an interpretation that the passage itself clearly rejects, clearly does not have in view? Well, I'll tell you why. Because most people, including evangelicals, are afraid of divine plurality. That's why. And I'll be a little gentler. And when it comes to New Testament scholars, they've never run into the divine council at all. And, and that's that's a, just a reality. When you go through graduate school, your New Testament, you, you don't do Israelite religion. You, you just don't. I mean, you gotta, you got to focus somewhere. And you, it, it, it's, the, the problem is narrowness. Uh, and, and you just never run into it. I, I'm, I'm less kind to the Old Testament people because they, they should have run into this a long time ago. But again, it's my own story. Well, how did I miss it? But it's very clear how the Jews are taking this. We, we're going to stone you because you've just blasphemed. You've made yourself God. And so Jesus is going to defend himself. And look at his proof text. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, you are gods? That's Psalm 82, verse 6, first part of it. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and scripture cannot be broken, do you say of him whom the Father consecrated and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God? See, now, Jesus also knows, and he assumes they know, when he quotes the first part of Psalm 82, verse 6, he assumes that they know the second part. You know, Psalm 82, verse 6, I, I said, you are gods, all of you, sons of the Most High. So he's hooking into the, into the verse, and most of these guys have the text memorized. That's what you do when you're Pharisees and scribes and all that. So he's, he's taking them to Psalm 82, and he's, he's questioning blasphemy. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand. Here's another line. That the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. Again, they sought to arrest him, but he escaped from their hands. Now, look at the, these two statements. You have back here, I and the Father are one. And you have down here, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. They're, they're pretty strong statements of deity. And the Jews take them that way. They're not happy. And sandwiched in between is Jesus' defense of what he's saying. And he quotes Psalm 82. Now, that much is clear. You got verse 30. The Jews consider the statement blasphemy, and he says he's in the Father and the Father's in him. There's, there's just really no ambiguity here. What isn't clear is why he cites Psalm 82 in defense of his claim. At least it's not clear to a lot of people. I, I, I'm going to explain why I think it, it's pretty clear. Anyway, how does, he, how does his use of Psalm 82 defend the statement that I and the Father are one? How is it consistent with that statement? Now, every John commentary, and I didn't change the slide here, it's still true. I have yet to find an academic commentary in the Gospel of John that lands on Psalm 82, speaking of plural Elohim, supernatural beings, in a council presided over by, by Yahweh himself. There are some that mention the idea, but I've, I have yet to find a commentary that lands there. Everybody lands at essentially the same place. They take the psalm to be speaking of Jewish elders or Israelites or Jews in general. In other words, mere mortals. And you might be thinking, you should, well, you should be thinking a couple things. 
why would you call men gods? And why would the Pharisees disagree with this? I mean, if, if, if Jesus is lumping them into Psalm 82, that, hey, you guys are sons of God too, just like me. We're like the same. We're buddies. You know? okay. why, they, that is obviously not how they're hearing him. So why do, why do commentators opt for this view? Again, how does it reinforce what Jesus is saying? Now, John spends a good deal of time talking about the deity of Christ. If you've done any Bible study in John at all, you know this is a theme in the Gospel of John. John's Gospel is the one that contains the I am statements, before Abraham was, I am. And there's, there's a whole you know, list of them. John is pulling no punches when it comes to an assertion that Jesus is God in the flesh. He is Yahweh in the flesh. He is full deity. What I'm going to suggest to you is that John doesn't back off of it here. And of course, neither does Jesus in the conversation. So how do we interpret this? Now, I'm going to go through the mortal view, what I call the mortal view. This is the dominant view. And this is the view you're going to see in all the commentaries. That the gods of Psalm 82 are just men. They're either Jewish elders or Israelites generally. And here's how, how they get there. Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? They'll take the phrase, your law. I said, your gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came. They'll say, well, this, this must be a reference to the reception of the law by the Jews at Sinai because there's a reference to the law, and that's who the word of God at Sinai came to. It was the Jewish you know, community, the lead, or, the, or the leaders, or whoever. Well, there's a problem right off the bat. Jesus isn't quoting the Torah. He's quoting Psalm 82. Now, there are other places in the Old Testament where the, the whole Bible is referred to as your law, so, I mean, this, this does happen. Basically, the, the thing you guys claim to believe and live by, you know, it's just a generic statement. But if that's true, and it is, you can't isolate this to an event at Sinai. Sinai is never mentioned in Psalm 82. You have to import that context into the passage. It doesn't derive from the passage. So by definition, it's out of context. The Jewish elder option, okay? So we've got the law here, and some will say, well, okay, maybe it's not, maybe, maybe it's a reference to Exodus 18. And that's how we get the elder, that's how we get men to be gods, because in Exodus 18, you know, you remember the story, this is Moses and Jethro. Jethro, you know, his father-in-law says, you know, you're kind of burdened, you shouldn't be answering all these questions every day. Why don't you appoint elders or judges to help you out? And Moses says, well, that's a pretty good idea. Let's do that. And, and he does. You say, well, what does that have to do with gods? Rabbinic tradition, which most Christians follow now, say that the elders, the judges in Exodus 18, are referred to as God. Well, let's find out. Is that the case? Here's Exodus 18. And I want to explain to you what I'm doing here. Okay, we'll enlarge the text. Let's get rid of the interlinear view. I have created what is called a visual filter. It's the Elohim filter. And so I've asked the software to locate the Hebrew lemma Elohim and highlight it everywhere it occurs in the Hebrew Bible. Exodus 18 is in the Hebrew Bible. So let's turn on our visual filter. There we go. Check the box. You're going to notice something. Let's just scroll through. ESV, quite coherently, translates Elohim as capital G-O-D. It's a reference to the God of Israel. Except, now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. Well, that would be obviously a plural reference because Yahweh is greater than all the other gods. But every other place in the passage, it refers to God himself. There we go. We'll keep going just to make the point. Okay, there's the end of the chapter. If we read through the whole chapter, and I won't do it for the sake of time, you will all notice a second thing. The judges, the people who are appointed, are never 
called Elohim. Not once. They're also not called Elohim in other passages either. This is an invention. It is an invented view. Now, if, you, if you're having trouble sleeping at night, I recommend going to my website, thedivinecouncil.com. And you need the word the because somebody else owns the URL divinecouncil.com. That's not me. It's thedivinecouncil.com. On the right-hand side, there are some articles that get into this. Unfortunately, the one that I, I like getting into it best I'm not able to post because of copyright. It's a journal that doesn't post there, doesn't allow me to post the information up there. I could send you the article. It's, it's in a journal called um, Bible Translator. And it's a ref, it, I did two articles for them. One is, does Deuteronomy 32, 17 uh, presume plural Elohim? And yes, it does. You know, should, it, should it be translated gods? And the other one is an article about and this, this is the one you might, that would, if the first one doesn't put you to sleep, this one will get you. The second one is an examination of the noun Elohim when it's the subject of a plural predicator. It's, it's, it's about a dozen times, but I, some, when it's in the mouth of a pagan, I don't worry about that. When it's, when it's not, like when David says it or you know, the Torah says it or something like that, I focus on that. And I show that there isn't a single reference, even when Elohim is the subject of a plural verb, in those instances. There isn't a single reference where the judges are called that or, and where you need to translate it plural. There are other indicators in the context grammatically and contextually that show that we're talking about the God of Israel then. You know, why is it a plural verb form? Yeah. Occasionally they do it just for grammatical agreement. Elohim is a plural noun, we give it a plural verb, but the context always dictates the translation. Uh, so again, if you're having trouble sleeping, that's the place to go. Back to our, go ahead. <clears throat> the, the, the journal? Oh, the, T-H-E, the divine, and it's D-I-V-I-N-E, the divinecouncil.com. That's my website. I'll just, I'll show you what it looks like here. We have time. They're not in a rush. At least I'm not, but... See, I have my name at the top because I, I need to do that, because the other one I don't know. Uh, but on the right-hand side there, if, I'm, if I mark it academic or technical, I'm not lying to you. Okay, it'll be technical. And again, if you have trouble sleeping, there you go. Um, but it's discussed in a few of those. So Exodus 18 really isn't a good piece of evidence for the idea. Skip that because I use the software here. And every occurrence of Elohim except the one to foreign gods is singular, you know, the singular God of Israel. The men doing the judgment are never called Elohim. Uh, again, this is, I just threw this other slide in. It's not a description of Sinai because Psalm 82 never mentions Sinai. And you can read the whole chapter. You're not going to find Sinai in there. You could put it in if you want. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, you're not, the lightning bolt's not going to come from heaven, I, although it, many times I wish it would. When people do this to Psalm 82, but, you know, there you go. Now, the right view, because it's supported by the grammar and the context, is that the gods here are divine beings. Here's Psalm 82, verse 1. God has taken his place in the divine council. It's the gods he holds judgment. Gods here, Elohim, the first, here's the first god, second Elohim. They're both Elohim. I talked about this yesterday. This one is singular because the verb form that it goes with is singular. It's very obvious. Plural, and you can't be in the midst of one. Okay. Well, maybe this is like the, the Trinity. You know, you can be in the midst of the Trinity, Mike. Well, good for you, because God's going to proceed in verses 2 and 5 to tell the members of the Trinity that they're corrupt and they're going to die like men. That doesn't work real well. So, you got to let the plurality be what it is. We talked about the meaning of Elohim yesterday. It's just a term you would use as a writer to <clears throat> identify a being or an entity that is by nature disembodied and a member of the spiritual world. But i got to tell you a little story about this, too. So I, I had published an article on, and in academia this was somewhat controversial, controversial. 
academics like to take Psalm 82 and other passages and, and say that Israelites initially were polytheists and that this Psalm and Deuteronomy 32 and a few other places have Yahweh and El or Yahweh and El Elyon, the most highest separate deities and that proves you know, polytheism. So I wrote this paper against that view. And you know, it got published you know, in a journal and within that view, I talk about the meaning of Elohim. So I thought, <clears throat> I, 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 that went too well. I need public humiliation. So I'm going to read this paper at, a, at the International Society of Biblical Literature conference. Actually, I had to come up with a paper so that Logos would fund my trip. <laughs> and so I, this one's handy. Let's do that. <laughs> So I, I, I went, you know, I got to go to Edinburgh, which is where this particular meeting was. It took my wife long. It was a real nice trip. But I have to read this paper. So I'm, I'm in the room. And again, if you've read any of my stuff or you've read Israelite religion, this name's going to be familiar. So we're about ready to start. And in walks Nicholas Wyatt. He's a professor at Edinburgh. He's retired now. He's a big Ugaritic scholar in Israelite religion. I, I watched him come in, and I'm thinking, this could go really badly. <laughs> You know, it's like, so what, what's going to happen? And my wife's there in the front row, and Wyatt goes to the back as most of the seats are taken. So I'm into this paper. And when I got to the point about, you know, the reason we have this is, you know, Elohim is just a term you would use for a, a, an entity that was disembodied, a member of the spiritual world. Wyatt stands up in the back and goes, yes, finally. <laughs> and it's like, what, are you going to start the wave or what? <laughs> But he was so excited that somebody figured it out. And it's like, oh, well, this could go pretty well now. You know? But I, I didn't know. He hadn't done anything on it. But it, it, was, it was just a nice, good, good. You know? And I, I chatted with him afterwards and thanked him for his enthusiasm. <laughs> but it's, and again, when, 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 you, when you finally actually just look at the term and ask yourself, why would biblical writers use this term of five or six different things other than the God of Israel? See, because in evangelical circles, you know, you go through this material, and I never know who's in the audience. And I, I, I don't want to say I don't care, but I used to care more than I do now. I, I know this creeps people out because we are taught, and, and our brains just move this way, because we're taught by Western culture and our own Christian tradition. We are taught that the letters G, O, and D equal, a, and all these words are important, a specific set of unique attributes. Omniscience, omnipresence, eternality, you know, sovereignty, all that stuff. We are taught that when you see the letters G, O, and D, those are, you know, that, that word goes with these attributes. It's incorrect for obvious reasons. The biblical writers did not think about the word Elohim the way we are taught to think about the letters G, O, and D. Because they use Elohim of different things than the God of Israel. So if Elohim is about a unique set of specific attributes, then those other Elohim have those attributes. Including like the disembodied dead. You know, I'm sorry, but like my dead aunt is not at an ontological level with the God of Israel. And no Israelite would think that. If, at least if they were sane or, you know, they they, they were even had a whiff of orthodoxy about them. I mean, they, they, this one, you know, Yah, the way I summarize it is, look, you've got a lot of Elohim. It's just another way of referring to spiritual beings. That's all it is. And there, in the spiritual world, there's a lot of these. You've got the realm of the dead. You've got, you know, the presence of Yahweh himself, you know, the, the afterlife idea. You've got the gods of the nations. You know, you've got you know, Ashtaroth and Chemosh in the Hebrew text, they're called Elohim. They are not at the level of the God of Israel. And no Israelite, no biblical writer anyway, is going to think that. If you walked up to Abraham and you said, hey, Abraham, are there other Elohim? He'd go, like, duh. <laughs> and, and, okay, good. And, and all the Elohim are, are basically the same. He'd probably just punch you in the face. Okay, Abraham does not believe they're all the same. Biblical writers do not believe they're all the same. How do we know that? Because biblical writers talk about this one, Yahweh of Israel, in ways that they never talk about the other ones. You don't get that theology from the word Elohim. You get that theology from reading your Bible. You know, just how God is described as opposed to how the others are described. 
And there's a disconnect there. So Yahweh is an Elohim. And there's a bunch of Elohim. Yahweh is one of them, but none of the other Elohim are Yahweh. That's what a biblical writer believed. That is not polytheism. See, we think polytheism because we're taught G, O, and D denotes a specific set of attributes. It doesn't. It denotes a, a, a divine being, a supernatural being. It's a, it's a way that they would use to refer Elohim. You're a disembodied member of the spiritual world. You're not of this world, you're of that world. So if we look at it again for what it says, you go down to verse 6. Right, let me go to Psalm. Yeah, we'll hit Psalm 89. If you go down to Psalm 82, verse 6, I'll just quote it to you. Because this is the, the part Jesus quotes. You have God, the God of verse 1 here, addressing the other Elohim. He reams them out in verses 2 through 5. You have failed your charge. I assigned you to the nations. This is the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, because the, the, the psalm ends in a very particular way that reinforces that. You're corrupt, you're wicked, you're evil. You get down to verse 6. I said you are gods, you're Elohim, all of you, sons of the Most High. Sons is plural. But you're going to die like men. You're going to fall like any prince. Or you could translate it any shining one, any, you know, any, any lesser being. Okay, you, I'm the one who has control of life and death. Okay, and I'm judging you to death. You are going to die. There's going to be a time when you cease to exist. Your existence is contingent upon my pleasure. Okay, that's the point. And then the, the psalm ends where the psalmist cries out, Rise up, O God, and take the nations. Who has the nations now? It's the sons of God. It's Deuteronomy 32.8 and a whole bunch of other verses. Okay. If you've read Supernatural or Unseen Realm, this is familiar to her. God punished humanity at Babel by assigning them to the sons of God as caretakers. God divorced humanity. So I'm done with you guys. This is our third go-around. We've had Eden. We had, son, we had Genesis 6, and then I, I sent the flood. First, I kicked you out of my presence. That didn't work. Then we, we send the flood to wipe the slate clean. That didn't work, and I promised to never do it again. So now we're at it again. And, you know, humanity is, is in rebellion, so he says, okay, you don't want me to be your God, you don't want to take your marching orders from me, fine. I'm going to give you what you apparently want. I'm going to assign you to lesser beings. This is Deuteronomy 32, 8. When the Most High divided up the nations, that's a reference to Babel, that's when the nations get divided, he divided them up according to the number of the sons of God. But Israel is Yahweh's portion. Jacob is his inheritance. Because God divorces humanity en masse, assigns them to lesser beings, and, and they're supposed to rule according to God's rules of justice. That's what we find out in Psalm 82. That's why God's mad at them, because they don't do that. They're not supposed to take worship for themselves, but they do. They even seduce the Israelites. If you keep reading in Deuteronomy 32, you hit verse 17, you know, you have the Israelites, you know, were sacrificing to Shadim, which most English translations translate as demons. It's kind of an unfortunate translation. Shadim is the plural of an Akkadian term, Shadu, which means a territorial entity, which makes perfect sense in the, in the context of Deuteronomy 32, because we're talking about geography. But they, the, they seduce the Israelites into following them. That, that's not what God wanted. So God divorces humanity, and in the very net, what happens in the biblical story right after Babel? He calls Abraham. He says, now watch, I'm not done yet. I've kissed you guys goodbye, but not permanently. I'm going to go to Ur, and I'm going to call this one guy. And he's a perfect candidate because he's old, and his wife is old, and can't have kids, but I'm going to enable her to have a child. And I'm going to start my own human family all over again. Just watch. They're my portion. They are my inheritance. And so God makes a covenant with Abraham to do all that stuff. And then he, he squeezes in the covenant language that through your seed, all of the nations that I just divorced will be blessed. I'm not forgetting about them permanently. But they are under judgment. They are exiled from me. And if they want to come back to me, they have to go through you. That's why they got to become part of the Israelite community. The Israelite community is the only one that has access to the truth about the true God. You must be in right relationship with God through them until we get the seed, who is Jesus. That's what Paul says in Galatians 3 and Galatians 6. I mean, all of these thoughts are connected. This is, this is the, the, the tapestry of the biblical salvation story. It's just that, unfortunately, evangelicalism sucks the supernatural right out of it. 
but, but they have to retain the belief in God and Jesus and a trinity and Satan and angels and demons. And we'll call it good. They don't really do anything. They fly around. You know, you know it, and somehow it's okay to be a supernaturalist there, but not okay over here. I got news for you. Nothing we believe is going to appeal to a rationalist mind, to a materialist mind. Nothing we believe is normal and respectable to them. But for some reason we think, well, this, is, this isn't going to make people laugh at me, but this will. Why? Again, that's the uncomfortable thing for you know, a lot of people about unseen realm and some other things. But God is judging the gods in council. And, and some people will say, well, well, you know, these are men, and, and God can, uh, consults with them, or they consult with God, and then they're, they're the judges, and they make decisions. Well, that's nice. Because if you look over in Psalm 89, this is Psalm 89, we get the same language. Let the heavens praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness in the assembly, assembly of the holy ones, for who in the skies can be compared to the Lord? Who among the heavenly beings, there's a footnote here, this is B'nai Elim, the sons of God, or the sons of the gods, you could, you could translate that too, but sons of God is, again, contextually, because we're dealing with one here, the way to translate it, a God greatly to be feared in the council of the Holy One. Well, here you have another divine council passage, sons of God who were Elohim back in Psalm 82, here we have sons of God here in the council, and guess what? It's in this guy's now, the last time I read my Bible, there weren't a bunch of Jewish elders ruling from the skies. Okay? They just aren't. Maybe I haven't looked closely enough, but I think I have. It doesn't work. Again, here's Psalm 82 again. So what in the world is Jesus doing? I, my view is that he was actually defending his deity. I don't need a drum roll for that. I mean, this is John. This is what John does. And it's sandwiched between I and the Father are one, and the Father is in me, and I'm in the Father. Why would Jesus undermine it in the middle? He wouldn't do that. John, as a writer, wouldn't do that. And the Pharisees certainly don't see it that way. So you've got everything in the context going against the dominant majority view. I'm just telling you, pick up a commentary on John, and it's going to land on the human view. And you're going to scratch your head, and you go, why? Well, I mean, that just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't have to make sense, citizen. No, move along. There's nothing to see here in Psalm 82. I mean, that, that, that's essentially what you get. And it's because the people haven't, they haven't been forced to sort of deal with it. If you're in Old Testament, you're in a doctoral program or something like that, you're forced to, you're, you're confronted with this on the first day. I mean, it just, critics love to throw this stuff at you. And it's your field, so you have to read all the literature about it. People in New Testament or systematic theology or churches, they don't have to read it. This is, they're lucky if they ever hear of it. It's just the way it is. So if we take the divine view, here's what I suggest. Here's John 10. You know, we got I and the Father are one. He quotes Psalm 82 right here in the middle, and then he's going to reinforce the claim down here. So what is he doing? I would suggest this. <clears throat> See if I need this slide or not. I don't. He's not saying, I'm just like you. That's the mortal view. Think with me here. When Jesus makes the statement and he watches them start to pick up stones, <laughs> he knows that he's pushed a button. And so he's going to draw on their knowledge of the text. He says, okay, calm down, fellas. Doesn't it say, I said, you are gods? He quotes Psalm 82, verse 6. Now he knows that they know the psalm. And because they know the psalm, they know immediately that, okay, sons of God in Psalm 82 are more than men. So the first stroke of Jesus is saying, you know, your own scriptures tell you that there are sons of God that are more than men. And the scripture cannot be broken. It's not lying to you. And then he follows that by saying, the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. And he's already told them, I and the Father are one. So he, Jesus, I can just summarize the rest of what we're doing this morning. Jesus quotes Psalm 82 to make two points. One, there are sons of God in your own Bible who are more than men. 
they're supernatural beings. So he's put himself into the song. So he's saying, I'm more than a man. But I'm not just one of them. I'm not just one of that group, the sons of God. There's something about me that's different. And I've already told you what it is. I and the Father are one. The guy presiding over the council who is sentencing these Elohim to death. That's me. I and the Father are one. The Father is in me, and I am in the Father. He's sticking it to them. That's what he's doing. He's using their own text against themselves. And the scripture cannot be broken. That's what he's doing. It's completely consistent. It's, it, 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 this, Jesus does this kind of stuff all over the place. I mean, there, there, are, there are really, I don't want to use the word clever because that sounds a little devious, but, but Jesus and other New Testament writers, they know how to push buttons in their audience. They don't throw things away. It's just that for us, it's either it's easy to read over it or we've been trained, like in this case, to not see it. But Jesus is completely consistent. He is not backing off. And you can tell at the end of, end of John 10, they sought again to arrest him. They want to put him on trial. They want to put him to death. They're not saying, oh, okay. You're just saying we're all sons of God together and we're all kind of part of the same family. Okay, that is not their reaction. They know what he's doing, and they don't like it. Yes, sir? Who are the sons of God? Who are the? The sons of God, the sons of God are the members of God's heavenly host. You know, the el- Angel is a job description. It's a functional term. Thank you for the segue into the commercial about my new book. Um, in, this kind of shameless self-promotion. <laughs> um, in the new book on angels, part of the reason I, that, that I wrote it, by the way, the, the new book on angels that shipped, what's today, the 21st, two days ago, that book is about the good guys, the loyal members of God's heavenly host. There's going to be a follow-up book. It's already written. They're all, I don't know what the, yeah, that are about the bad guys, Okay. Now, in, in the angel's book, I open the book talking about terminology. There are terms that are used of the members of the heavenly host. And, I, and I, I, t- I say it that way on the cover. That's the subtitle, what the Bible really says about God's heavenly host. That's deliberate because there are terms used of them that describe what they are, terms like spirits, okay? Describes their nature, what they are. There are terms that describe their place in hierarchy, Sons of God is one of those. It's drawn from ancient Near Eastern royalty language. And then there are terms that describe tasks or functions. And that's where angel falls. Angel just means messenger. So any one of the Elohim, any any spirit being, could be sent to take a message. Now later on in, in Judaism, in the course of Judaism, the term angel becomes more, it becomes used more frequently outside the Bible in Second Temple literature, and, and it gets picked up within the New Testament to denote generally those supernatural beings who both take messages and have not rebelled. They're the good guys. They're the white hats. And then there's a whole bunch of other descriptors, in, more so in the New Testament than in the Old, to describe the rebels. And there were three rebellions. As I mentioned yesterday, there are three reasons why the world is, is the chaotic mess that it is. It's not just the fall. There, there are three, three events that are referenced as creating this whole chaotic situation. So the terminology is important, but again, most of what most of what most Christians, and I include myself here again before you know having this watershed moment in grad school that actually forced me to go back and look at the text. Uh, most of what Christians think about angels and demons, they get from tradition. They get through the, the filter of, of just Christian tradition or even cultural tradition. You know, the whole angels have wings thing. I'll just rabbit trail here for a moment. There isn't a single passage in the Bible that says angels have wings. There's a passage in Zechariah that describes two women that are storks, and they have wings, and somehow we've conflated that over to those are angels. And it, just, it just it doesn't make any sense, and I discussed that passage. 
there's a passage that describes, one or two that describe angels descending. And so tradition assumed they have wings. It's the very same verb for when Jesus returns, descends from heaven. Did Jesus grow wings? Okay. You know. Yeah, I mean, and, and it gets picked up in artwork. And so the, these are the visuals we see, you know, throughout the course of, and I'm not saying this is like evil and sinister. It's just the way it is. I mean, it's just no, there's no sinister agenda behind it. It's just, it's just the way an idea gets perpetuated, both in literature and in art and, you know, just culture generally. So this is going to sound really goofy. What I'm trying to do in the angels book is give you a biblical view of angels. <laughs> You know, starting with the terminology and then discussing, well, what is it they actually do? And they're, you know, they, they participate in making decisions with God. There are passages like that. Sometimes they carry out decisions. Sometimes they take messages. They are assigned to believers, you know, to assist them. I mean, there's, there's a number of, in a couple of passages in Job where they, they, they form like a mediating function. Uh, I actually wrote a little article on this for Bible Study Magazine. Um, but I develop it, of course, a lot more in the book where they, they not only give messages to people, but in Job's context, uh, one of his friends, again, flippantly says, well, to which of the holy ones are you going to appeal? You know, you're complaining about what's going on with you. To which of the holy ones are you going to you know, make your case here? And, and there's, it's a, it was a common ancient idea, and it's within the Hebrew Bible in a few passages, where angels who are assigned to watch over you, they will go to God and talk to God, and then come back to you and try to explain why this is happening to you. Now, that sort of doesn't happen anymore when we get Jesus, because he is the lone mediator. There. It's kind of interesting how that just sort of goes away. But it does. Okay, angels do a lot of different things. So the, the first book is the good guys, the white hats. The second book, and, and, and I can honestly say this, the second book on the, on the powers of darkness, that's the, it's demons, the powers of darkness, you know, what the Bible really says about the powers of darkness. It's the first and only book that will approach the powers of darkness subject from the perspective of three rebellions. That You're not going to find that anywhere. And, and I do it intentionally and deliberately because that's, that's the way to make sense of it. And I, it's Old Testament, it's Second Temple literature, it's New Testament. Both books track through all three of those sections historically because those texts you know, interact with each other. So, you know, the sons of God is a hierarchical term for members of the heavenly host. Sons of God are typically, again, it's drawn from, from royalty imagery. You know, they, are, they, are, they are the intimate associates of the king. In the, in the human world, it's because well, they're probably his sons and relatives. You know, and, and so the biblical writers borrow the, 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 the metaphor of kingship because God is the ultimate king. And they will use sons of God for those agents that have special significant tasks. Deuteronomy 32.8, they were given charge over the nations. Now they wind up doing a really terrible job. Okay. And God knows. There are passages in Job where, where you know, Scripture says that God doesn't trust his holy ones. Why? He knows they can fail. They're not him. Of course they can fail. He is the lone perfect being with a perfect nature. They're not. So, I mean, he, he knows what he's dealing with, both in the heavenly world, he knows what he's dealing with over here. But the, the, the term is significant because those are the ones put over the nations and they fail. And consequently, those are the ones that are going to need to be replaced when the kingdom returns to earth. And who takes the place? That would be us. That's why we're called children, sons of God. That's why Paul says we're going to judge angels. That's why Jesus says in Revelation 2 and 3 that we were going to be put over the nations and share a seat with the Messiah, with him on his throne to rule the nations. This is, again, it's a coherent stream of theology. But when you, when you strip out the foundation of it, again, this supernatural worldview about how that world intersects with our world and how that world is a template for how God looks at humans, the way God looks at his supernatural family and the way he works with them, his purposes for them, that translates over to the way he looks at his human family. And, and he wants partners with us, too. We are his images just as they are. In their realm, we are in our realm, the, 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 the terrestrial realm. But if, if you're stripping, the, again, the supernatural context out of all of that, what you're left with is a fragmented picture that doesn't have any, under, any underlying connectivity. 
And this, this, is, this is what I actually tried to do in Unseen Realm. If you, if you haven't read it, it, at least read the introduction. The Unseen Realm is not an endpoint. Unseen Realm is the starting point. I will give you the lay of the land. And, I, and I'm being honest, if, if, you, if you read through the book, and if you have that stuff in your head, again, you will begin to see how things connect. I will build the mosaic for you. And then you can drill down, you know, wherever you want to. But you, you will not be able to read your Bible the same way again. So I, I tell you that up front, and people who sort of get over that hurdle um, get, have that experience, but it's a good experience. And I say it because that's what happened to me. You know, I, I, I can't look at anything anymore and because I, now I know the lay of the land. I'm, I'm looking for connections. And, and they're there. You just have to know what to look for. You have to have been exposed to the breadcrumb trails, you know, to the, whatever metaphor helps, the tapestry, the, the weaving in the tapestry. You gotta, you gotta be exposed to that because when you're exposed to it, you can't unsee it. You just can't. It's there. And why is it there? Because the biblical writers weren't morons, okay? They're, they're intelligent and they're being guided by the Holy Spirit to connect dots. Okay, what we have in our churches, and sorry for the, the, the sermonic, you know, spasm here, but what we have in our churches, even, even among the people who really care about Scripture, is we have a lot of people who know, they have a grasp of data points, but they don't know how to connect things. And so I tell people, if, if you have this sort of sneaking intuition in your head that there's got to be more than just these, these facts that I know, there, there's got to be something else here, your intuition is correct. There is. There, there are ways that they connect, that the dots connect. But you have to be willing to... to you got to be willing to set your tradition aside, even if you like it, even if it's helpful, it'll still be there to, to do nice things for you in your Christian life. You know, don't just like throw the baby out with the bathwater. But you can't use it as a filter for the text. And, you know, I, again, I had, to, I had to cross that Rubicon myself. Sometimes you lose friends, but you make other friends. And most people are, you know, okay, you're just kind of weird, so we'll live with you. You know, um, you, know you have that too. You had a, a question. Yeah, it's Genesis 3, it's the fall. Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is the, the transgression of the sons of God. And then the third one, I mean, Genesis 3 is, is, a, is a human supernatural transgression. Genesis 6, you know, you, you, you could argue for that on points as well. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, but what you really need is Deuteronomy 32, verses 8 and 9. And you can, you can track the whole nations allotted to the gods theme through Deuteronomy. Starts in Deuteronomy 4, 19 and 20, Deuteronomy 17, 1 through 3, Deuteronomy 29, 23 through 26, Deuteronomy 32, 8, 9, and verse 17. Um, you know, it, it, that is the exegetical basis for what we popularly call uh, spiritual warfare. You know, the, it, the, people, the, the connection point with most Christians in church who have some Bible under their belt is Daniel 10. The princes over the nations, the supernatural princes over the nations. Well, that, that comes from Deuteronomy 32. That's, that's how that situation begins. It's the Old Testament explanation for why, I mean, haven't you ever asked yourself this question? Hey, you know, like if everybody started out with, you know, humanity and relating to the, to the true God, where'd they get these other gods? Like, like, how'd that happen? How'd they go astray? This is your answer. They go astray because God judged them. And the caretakers put over them were corrupt and seduced them into worshiping themselves and abusing their populations. Um, you know, it, there's all sorts of passages. You know, scholars refer to this as cosmic geography, the th what emerges from this. Hermon is, is the traditional location, I'll answer that in two ways. Hermon is the traditional location for where the sons of God in Genesis 6 descended, either descended to or from, to, to hatch their, their rebellion, you know, to make their covenant with each other to, to do what they did. Now, I say to or from because it's really interesting. Hermon, as a location of the seat of the gods, you know, gods that are rival to Yahweh, actually goes back to Sumer. You, you can actually find Hermon in, in the, the forest of Lebanon, like in the Gilgamesh epic. This is where the gods live, the gods who are adversarial you know, to Yahweh. So it's actually a very old tradition that supernatural rebellion was associated with this place very early on. Um, there's there's, a, there's a, a wonderful but very technical article on that by a guy named Lipinski uh, that's really hard to find. If you wanted it, I could send it to you. I have it in PDF. Um, but 
yeah, it, it, this this informs the rest of the Bible. You know, after Babel, this is why it's Israel against the nations. This is why it's Yahweh against the other gods. It's rebellion. You know, there are all sorts of, of wonderful little passages that, that presume this. You know, the, the most obvious is Naaman the leper. Why doesn't Naaman ask for dirt? When he says, I know, that, I know now that the Lord, you know, Yahweh is the God of all gods, and from this point forward I will sacrifice to no other. And he asked Elisha for dirt. Can I take dirt back? He said, is that okay? Why? Because he wants to sacrifice on holy ground. He wants dirt that is associated with and under the dominion of the God of all gods. Well, maybe he stuffs some in his pockets or wears a little, because he tells Elisha, look, you know, I'm an important guy, and part of my job is I got to go into the temple of Ramon every year with the king. And I mean, he knows he's on hostile territory. So he, he, like, he like throws that into his explanation to Elisha of why he wants dirt. You know, the, the Philistines, the Ark of the Covenant gets taken, okay? And we know the story because we, we laugh at it in Sunday school, and I'll grant it. It's funny, okay? So they, they take the Ark of the Covenant to the Temple of Dagon, and the next day Dagon is a stump. You know, head, his limbs are off, his head's chopped off, and, you know, it freaks them out. You know, so then they, they come in there and they discover Dagon, and they say, probably a good idea to get rid of this thing, get rid of the Ark, <laughs> So they, they make a plan to get rid of it. But what we miss in the way we tell the story is a little line in 1 Samuel 5 that says, to this day, the priests of Dagon refuse to walk over the threshold of Dagon. Why? They're not taking any chances. Because this is the spot we found Dagon, and this ground is under dominion. Not of Dagon. So we're going to do our little rituals, but we're going to walk around. That's fine. Okay? I mean, we're, they're not going to take any chances. There are, all, there are all sorts of things like this. This is why Paul, you know, Paul inherits this worldview. It's what drives his ministry to reclaim the nations. He's the apostle to the Gentiles. And it leaks out in a lot of places. I discuss all this in Unseen Realm. But Paul does occasionally use the word demon. Uh, but most of the time when he refers to the powers of darkness, he uses terms like rulers, authorities, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions. Why? What do all those terms have in common? They are terms used within and outside the New Testament for geographical dominion. That's what Paul's tracking on. He knows that when he goes into a Gentile place, it's under dominion. But the authority of that entity has been delegitimized by the cross. See, the Most High was the one who put them there as a punishment, but it's the same Most High that became incarnate in Christ and died on the cross and now is the gateway, is the promised seed to reclaiming the nations. And so Paul can go into a, a pagan area and say, look, I mean, I actually had this experience. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of riffing here, and I'm sorry about the time, but we'll, uh, we'll make up for it. I'm, I'm like lying to you now. <laughs> um, I, I, it, I do recommend listening to it, but the audio is painful. But I, was on a, I got invited to do a pagan podcast one day. Have, have any of you listened to that? I get, a, I, get a, I get an email from a guy named Hercules. So, so like, <laughs> Hercules. <laughs> so I thought, well, I'll, I'll open this one up. This, is, this could be interesting. Uh, Hercules Invictus. Um, and his, his podcast is called The Voice of Olympus. He worships the gods of Greece and Rome. So his email said, I just read Supernatural, and I loved it. Because will you come on my podcast because I want to talk about it. And I worship the gods of Greece and Rome, and I just can't find anybody that I can really talk to. Oh. And I'm thinking, like, yeah, I'll bet. You know, it's just <laughs> so so I, I said, sure, you know, this this will be interesting. So I go on this show. I've, I've actually been on twice now, but I, I go on this show, and like for the first 10 minutes, it's this guy going through Greco-Roman literature that describes the Deuteronomy 32 worldview. That the nations are a lot of the gods and this god gets this one and you know, the, how, how this was done. It's very clear that the Gentiles understood the whole idea. And I mean, you can find it in Plato and it just, you know, there's, there's a lot of it. And so he goes through this whole thing and he goes, this is why I was so excited. It's like, it's like you, know, you understand this, you know, you're, and, and it's in the Bible. And he goes, but I, you know, it occurred to me, and he goes, I just have one question. It, it occurred to me that if the Bible says that Yahweh set up this whole system, what does he want? And I said, 
I'm so glad you asked. <laughs> so, you know, and we got to go into the whole narrative of salvation history about reclaiming the nations and Paul. And, and I thought to myself, this is probably what it was like every day for Paul. Like this is a conversation he would have had every day in, in whatever city he's in. You know, and the, the, the most fun part for me was in the, during the commercial breaks, they have, you know, they, they have to play these ads or whatever. And one of them is for the network that this guy's podcast is on. It's the Pagan Podcast Network or whatever. And, and there's this real sinister, deep voice that comes on and says, the Pagan Podcast Network, all pagan, all the time. And I thought, <laughs> not today. <laughs> today is the exception. Um, so, you know, this, this is a worldview that the New Testament is well aware of because of the old. Second Temple, you know, intertestamental literature, you see the same thing. Greco-Roman literature, you see the same thing. Now, what ought to be going through your mind is, why haven't I heard this before? I don't want to make you angry, but I, I do want to plant that in your head. <laughs> be nice. Um, it's important. It, 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 it's not like you know, and I, I don't have to do, really do this anymore because the you know a lot of people have read the book. But I used to have to like remind people, look, unseen realm and this other stuff I write. It's not that Mike is saying, well, you thought the gospel was A, but Mike says it's B. Okay, it's not that at all. What it, what the <sighs> unseen realm, the subtitle is recovering the supernatural worldview of the Bible, and that's that's intentional. What it gives you is not a new gospel. You you already know what the gospel is, and it, it's just crystal clear. But what it gives you is a framework for understanding how it plays out before, during, and after. And, and again, how, these, how God's supernatural world connects with the terrestrial world. How God looks at believers. You know, it's a template kind of thing. And it's, it's scattered through the whole of Scripture. And yes, you could never read anything that I produce and still understand the gospel and, and, and learn scripture and enjoy the Christian life, and I hope you do. But if you really want to understand scripture, you've got to start getting your head into this stuff. And you, you've got to start letting it, again, the, let the Israelite live in your head, run free. Okay, you, you, just, you just have to do that. And if, if you don't want to invest the time, I mean, I... On one level, I understand that, but on the other level, I really don't understand it. Because if, if you think this is the word of God, there ought to be a little something inside you that would like to know what it means. Just a little bit. And, and again, I've been dragged kicking and screaming to the conclusion. That there, are, there are two conclusions in, in my life that I've been dragged kicking and screaming to. One is, and this was years ago and it hurt, was realizing that not every Christian is really into the Bible like you are, Mike. That bothered me for a while. Number two is most Christians confuse Bible reading with Bible study. They are not the same. I didn't want to believe that. I've learned that. I learned the second one at Logos, and I, one of my bosses kept saying that. You got to understand the customer. You got to. You know, it's like I don't want to believe that. That's not true. It's not true. It is true. But here's a third thing that's true. In every congregation, there are people who are craving content. Every one of them. Um, I've spoken in Anglican churches. I've been in Presbyterian such, you know, churches. I've been at Lutheran church. Yeah. I don't care about the non denominational stuff. And there are people in every church that they understand the gospel. They they're either are or still committed, you know, or, or loosely committed to a denominational context but they are hungry for content. And I believe that their pastors, and I'm including evangelical non-denominational situations here too, I believe that pastors routinely underestimate both the appetite and the aptitude for content. I, I've just, I've seen too much of it. And so, you know, I think there's a fear factor and there's also a, a labor factor. Um, you know, that pastors are in a tough situation. They have they, frankly, they have too much to do that takes away you know, from their investment in Scripture in many, in many contexts. But there's also a fear factor among them. It, it scares them to have to do fundamental rethinking because it, it feels a lot like work, and it is work. Um, but it's worth it. 
and people will appreciate it. In a Calvary Chapel situation, you, I don't know if you realize this, but I don't know if you realize how exceptional you are. I mean, you, you, you got to get that in your head, too. Um, and like I was telling Terry the other day, because this is my third Calvary Chapel church that I've been in. And I, I've met, you know, like I said, a half a dozen you know, others, and I, I would ask the same question. Why do these churches, why are they filled? Why do they grow? And the answer is always the same. It's because we, we do verse-by-verse -verse exposition in, in Scripture. And like I told you yesterday, I used to think that was a gimmick. That's not a gimmick. I thought it was a gimmick because I grew up with that, and I thought it was normal. It's not, it, I mean, for me, I, I was spoiled. That was my experience. So I just thought, well, this is what happens in church. But if, if you hear an answer like that to the same question you know, every time, it's like, well, I guess that isn't what happens in most churches, which, which is really pitiful. It's really unfortunate. So, okay, end, end of sermon. This is, this is why I don't do pastoring. I just sort of drift off. Um, Let's take a break. Where's Terry? He, prob he probably like fainted in the back or something. <laughs> okay, let's take a little break and we'll, we'll hit the other one. Hey, man, grab some coffee. Yeah, in a couple of weeks, we'll, we'll get it started on Sunday morning. Oh, 11 o'clock. 11 o'clock service. Over in the old floor, and you're going to have to get there early because they'll, oh, they'll pack out. The, yeah, the book you want to get is on Seeing Realms. Because that's some of the materials we're going through. So. Awesome. Cool. And last, we can all together be praying for brother to just stick around and keep <laughs> right. I, I gotta go home to my pug I, I found out yesterday my pug has an ear infection so he needs me you can bring the pug to you I've suggested that in, in charging five dollars for a picture with Maury <laughs> but uh, we, we won't go there so. <laughs> If, if you want to see Maury, I, I, I'm not sure where, if, how many of you are on Twitter? Okay, a couple, Facebook, a few more. Um, if you go to my Facebook page, I think it's the author page. Like there's one, I don't know much about Facebook to be honest with you. There's one that's my personal account and then there's one that's uh, Michael S. Heiser that is an author page that was created by Lexum. But they posted a, a, I hope it's funny, I think it's funny, a promotional video to promote angels. It's less than a minute long. Has anybody seen that? It's, I'm, I'm wearing a white tuxedo <laughs> on, a, on an all-white background. Oh, no. The wings? Uh, no, I don't have wings. So good. I, I, I said lose the wings. Uh, <clears throat> but it's, it's, it's talking about sort of, in, in a fun way, you know, these, these mythical ideas we have about you know, angels. And at the end, my pug is in it. So that was a big day in the studio. Everybody couldn't wait to see the pug. And he's wearing wings. So the pug does have wings. So. And a white tuxedo? No. no that, was, that was for me. He got the wings. I got the tuxedo. Uh, okay. We're going to talk about Genesis 6, 1 through 4. The, the, like it says here, the, the ancient original context to it. Um, if you want sort of the print version of this, uh, reversing Hermon is where I spend the most time talking about the ancient Near Eastern background to Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You get some of it in Unseen Realm, naturally. But reversing Hermon was, I, I did this book to sort of drill down specifically on Genesis 6, 1 through 4, or as the Book of Enoch would, would refer to it, the, you know, the, the sin of the watchers in First Enoch 6 through 16. And the thesis of the book is, is you know, I want you to, to know not only what's going on here but, and the, the ancient Near Eastern Mesopotamian background to it, but then how, if, if you know the background to it, how that material bleeds into the New Testament. So that's what reversing Hermon is essentially about, the, the importance of this passage in a number of passages in the New Testament. So we're going to talk about these four verses and the fifth verse that's going to be important, and there's a reason I put it this way. This is probably a familiar passage to most of you. <clears throat> when man, you know, Adam, humankind, began to multiply in the face of the land, and daughters were born of them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive. They took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterward, 
when the sons of God came into the daughters of man and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. It's, a, it's an odd, strange passage and probably familiar to most of you here. It's very controversial. Um, you know, again, this is one of those that, let me put it this way. <clears throat> if, if you get into, a, you know, sort of an argument with, with somebody about this, that, you know, the sons of God are just people, the sons of Seth or, you know, kings or whatever it is, what you have to realize is that the, the person in front of you is actually suggesting that the ancient Israelites looked at the passage like we do in a modern anti-supernaturalistic post-enlightenment era. Just think about that. That is not their world. They are, they are just out of the gate predisposed to supernaturalism. We are not because of the time in which we live. There's a lot of you know, water under the bridge between the Old Testament era and today. And we have had, uh, again, our comfort level with the supernatural has been eroded steadily and consistently because we think somehow that, well, we're moderns and we can dispense with this stuff. But since we're Christians, we sure need this, the virgin birth. We need the hypostatic union, the fact that Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. Somehow, this isn't offensive to a rationalist post-enlightenment worldview. Somehow we, we retain some respect if we believe this stuff, but we're going to lose all that if we look at Genesis 6 the same way and other passages. And my answer is, why? That, that's the uncomfortable question. Why, why do you think this is sort of normal and acceptable and the other is not? Frankly, these are more astonishing. Okay, the, the idea of a trinity. Like I said a few minutes ago, there's nothing that we believe in the core doctrines of Christianity that is going to be acceptable on a purely rationalistic, materialistic basis. Zero. So you might as well face up to it. Now, I will say it's all defensible in terms of its philosophical, intellectual coherence. All these ideas, beginning with theism, all you know, the, the Genesis six stuff is. Again, I think I tend to think of things very simply. All of this stuff extends from the major premise that there is a God. It's theism. If that premise holds, then ideas that extend from it are like these. Well, can God like do stuff? Can he create? Well, sure. You know, does he create with a purpose? Could, is it possible that he could, you know? endow his, his supernatural creatures with the ability to take on, you know, human form. Well, again, we know that from passages in, in the Bible. You know, is, is that form physical? I mean, you, can, you, you go down the list of all the things that can God do this, and it's a really short list of, of things God can't do. I mean, I try not to put the words can't and God into too many sentences. But again, all of these, these ideas that, unfortunately, even within the evangelical community, we, we take the supernatural stuff in the Bible and we say, this is valid and this is invalid. You know, I, I don't know what gives us the authority to, to, to make these two categories, but we do it thinking again that we need to do it to defend ourselves as not crazy people. Okay, nothing we believe that is integral, the concept of sin and, and the removal of sin. That is inherently, inescapably supernatural. Why is that one acceptable and this isn't? And, and since the idea of God has been defended philosophically, its coherence has been defended and has held for millennia, it's done really well since it holds these other things that derive from it, there's no reason to just dismiss them out of the gate. But again, unfortunately, in our context, that makes a number of people uncomfortable. It made Augustine uncomfortable. And that's really why we, we, we sort of have grown up as a church, as, as, as you know, big C Christianity, 
with the Sethite view. Everybody in the Jewish community and the early Christian community, you know, there, there's, a, there's one possible exception in, in, a, in a passage in Philo, but, but all of, all of the, you know, the, the texts we have up until just before the time of Augustine with a guy named Julius Africa, or Scipio Africanus, um, <clears throat> believed that what's described in Genesis 6, 1 through 4 was a divine transgression, a supernatural rebellion that impacted humanity, that, that this is what's being described here. That changes, again, in the fourth century. And because of Augustine's stature, and frankly, he had a problem with the Book of Enoch because of his, his history with the Manichees. When he became a, a Christian, he was part of the Manichaean sect for a while. And things did not go well. And the Manichees revered the Book of Enoch uh, for you know, different reasons. And so by the time Augustine emerges from that, he has a bone to pick with them and with the Book of Enoch and all this stuff, and he just goes the other direction. And because of the magnitude of his personality and who he was uh, as a theologian, the, basically the rest of the church followed suit. And Augustine has that, that kind of weight in other areas too. But this, again, is, is part of that. You know, we, and so we call, as I say in Unseen Realm, we call out hermeneutical SWAT teams to make passages like this not say what they say while we keep stuff like the Trinity and the Virgin Birth. It's very inconsistent. I understand why we do that, but it's, it's very inconsistent. Now, Peter and Jude, I think, is, is typically the place to start. We're not going to go through the whole, all the ins and out of the Sethite view, but Peter and Jude clearly did not view the sons of God in this incident as mere humans. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell. This is going to be, a, we're going to come back to this. The word there is sent them to Tartarus. Tartarao is the verb. And committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept with until judgment. If he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness, with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of God. I mean, it's clear, the context is clearly the flood. He refers to them as angels that sinned. But, why isn't that clear? Well, it's not clear because people don't want it to be clear, and then they, again, you call it the hermeneutical SWAT team to make it say something other than what it actually says. There are real problems with that. There's no other candidate for angels that sinned. Now, some people will reflexively go, well, what about the third of the angels rebelling, you know, that before humans were created and the fall of Lucifer and stuff like that? Okay, try not to be shocked here, but there isn't a single verse in the Bible that describes a rebellion of a third of the angels before the creation of humanity. Zero. The only place, in fact, that you get a th the word third with the word angel is Revelation 12, which is the last book of the Bible. And the reference is to the, again, pardon the pun, the fallout of the birth of the Messiah. That's what you've got. Now, we basically get this third of the angels rebelling before creation from two sources. One is it was imported there in the 19th century to help argue something called the gap theory. The other is, is writers like Milton, Paradise Lost. Okay, neither of those things is the biblical text. But they were just, again, these are things that get passed on from generation to generation to generation. And, and they in this case, they actually become in some way doctrines. Um, I mean, that, that does happen with, with a few subjects. But if you actually go with the biblical text, and of course, one that's associated with the flood, you don't really have any ammunition there. So it's kind of obvious that, that casting into hell chains of gloomy darkness, you'll notice these descriptions, you're not going to find the casting anyway, and you're not going to find a specific reference to chains in the Old Testament, either in Genesis 6 or elsewhere. So Peter is drawing on something else. Now we're going to find out that the something else happens to be the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch, though, draws on a Mesopotamian story that really was the background to Genesis 6. You realize that Enoch and other Dead Sea Scrolls, like, like guys like Gilgamesh actually appear by name in those texts. Whoever's writing that material has a very strong acquaintance with Mesopotamian material. And it's going to come out in, in what's, what's called the story of the Apkalu, which is the Mesopotamian backstory to, what, to why we even have Genesis 6, 1 through 4 in the Bible. 
Peter and, and Jude aren't going back and reading cuneiform. They don't need to because that material has been preserved in books like Enoch. And so this is where they're, they're getting it. Jude 6 and 7, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in, there's the chains again, there's the gloomy darkness again, until the judgment of the great day. Then he mentions Sodom and Gomorrah. What happens before Sodom and Gomorrah in the biblical story? Well, it's the story of the flood, so here we go again, the angels and its sin. And again, any, any commentator, any academic commentator will tell you that there's a strong relationship between 2 Peter and Jude, you know, in terms of its content and all that kind of stuff, and its vocabulary. Again, it's set in a, in a sexual context and likewise indulged in sexual immorality. And again, there, there's really no other possible reference than Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And Peter and Jude aren't afraid of that. It doesn't bother them. It bothers a lot of people now, but it doesn't bother them. Kept in chains under gloomy darkness. Again, that really points to the original context as we will see. So, the real death blow to the Sephite view is this question. Are you going to interpret scripture against its original context or not? And I have said on, on, my, uh, on my blog that I, I've referenced, if, if, I'll just spell it out for you. If you want to go look for this, this will be the easy way to find it. Go to Google, put in my website, drmsh.com, and then put in the, the, the author's last name, Anos, A. N-N-U-S, Amar Anos is his full name. He's a cuneiform scholar in Helsinki. And then Genesis 6, 1 through 4. And you will find his article. He wrote a, an article in 2010 that is just really of fundamental importance. The article is called On the Origin of the Watchers. And he traces, because this is his field, he's a Mesopotamian guy, he traces Enoch's watcher story back on many levels and in many layers back into the Mesopotamian stuff. And in so doing, he provides, again, from the Old Testament world, the, the context of Genesis 6, 1 through 4. He, he, he shows you what Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is shooting at. And he also does something that, that is really important. If you, have you ever read Genesis 6, 5? Okay, that's the verse about you know, that God you know, saw the, the wickedness of man, that every imagination or the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Well, what does that have to do with the first four verses? Have you ever wondered that? Like, like why do we get to that verse? How do we get from Genesis 6, 1 through 4 to that? If you know the backstory, you have the answer to that. Well, I'm going to show you that today. It, it's completely consistent and coherent. It's just that the writer of Genesis 6 assumes that you know the context because he's writing to people in his world, not ours. Yes, ma'am. drmsh.com, that's my homepage. And the last name of the guy is A-N-N-U-S. And you could put in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You're gonna, it's gonna be the top, you know, first, first or second hit in the Google results. But you can download his article there. Now, let's go back to Peter. This cast them into hell, Tartarao is the Greek verb, cast them into Tartarus. This is another important clue. Tartarus was the place in the Greek Titan story where the Titans, who are rebellious gods, they're not people, folks, they're rebellious gods, they were cast for their transgression. Again, it's a, it's a clear, if you're using this verb in this place, it's a clear, unmistakable reference to a divine rebellion. That's all it can be. So again, do you want to interpret the passage in light of its own context or what context that you give it so that it's more comfortable? That's the question. So 2 Peter and Jude refer to the rebellious sons of God being imprisoned in darkness. Now, where does all this stuff come from? Again, the short answer is Peter and Jude are dipping into Enoch and other Second Temple texts. Jubilees has this stuff in it, the Book of the Giants from Qumran. The Book of the Giants is a fragmentary text. Um, I don't know... I don't know anywhere, like on the internet, where the English translation is published. There, there is a complete, very thorough, even mind-numbingly thorough, um, scholarly edition of the Book of Giants from Qumran by Lauren Stuckenbrook, um, which is really good. And we have it in Logos, by the way, so you can actually just read the translation there. Um, but I, I, I'm just not sure where you could find that. And again, most of it's fragmentary anyway. There's just sections of it. 
But this is the material, again, that, that the New Testament writers had access to, and they're reading this stuff because it's part of what their community is producing, talking about the Bible. It's like if I read a commentary on a biblical book, or you read you know, some, some book about a biblical topic. This is what they're doing. They're not doing anything different than what we do. They read books. And some of those books help them process information and become very useful when they try to articulate a thought in their own writings. It's just the most normal thing in the world. This is how people do research and how they think about things and then how they write things. Okay, so in First Enoch, the sons of God are known as watchers. That's the major term. And it's, it's a biblical term as well. It occurs four times in, in the Old Testament, all of them in Daniel 4. And it's a neutral term in Daniel 4. I, I guess I could say a positive word. Just don't conclude, in, at least in Daniel 4, that watchers are bad guys. They're not. In Second Temple literature, they are, because everybody's talking about Genesis 6. So those are, they're bad guys there. They descend to, you know, on or to Mount Hermon, and they make a vow to corrupt humanity. Again, their sin isn't just the transgression with daughters of men. There's something worse in the Jewish mind. And Enoch says, and this will be, again, important for the connection to the Messiah, that the sons of God taught humans certain points of knowledge that led to self-destruction and idolatry. So, in other words, what, what, what this is really saying is, look, human depravity, which began in Genesis 3 at the fall, there's rebellion. It was accelerated and taught to perform better by divine intelligences who wanted to destroy humans. That's the thought, that there, there, are, there are oppositional supernatural intelligences, both then and of course now, that love to have people, love to help people, love to play on our propensities and our depravities and our proclivities, our sinful impulses, our desire for autonomy from authority. They love to help that along so that we can more effectively destroy ourselves and the people around us. And the bonus is we can become idolaters. We worship other gods. We're no god at all. We worship ourselves. This was the big concern in Second Temple literature. It wasn't the Nephilim. Because according to the biblical text, the Nephilim lines are, are wiped out during the time of David, who, by the way, is the archetype for the Messiah. That might be important. Right? That's when that ends, but this problem persists. It's a big issue. Here are some of the things, again, that they taught. There's astrology, technology for warfare, helps to kill more people effectively. Roots and spells, you know, the drugs, the cosmetics, which sounds odd, but the point is, again, seduction, you know, immorality outside the boundaries of marriage and all that kind of stuff, you know, just sexual indulgence. So this is the backdrop, actually, for Genesis 6, 5. So the reason we have verse 5 is because if you know the rest of the story in Genesis 6, 1 through 4, it's not just the Nephilim. If you know that the story is also responding to something about supernatural intelligence intelligence is corrupting humans from within. If you know that, Genesis 6, 5 makes perfect sense because the effect of all this is that every thought of the imagination of their hearts was only evil continually. Now, Peter and Jude know this because they do know the backstory. And the backstory extends again from Second Temple literature, which draws on earlier Mesopotamian stuff. And that's what we want to get into. So <clears throat> here's the, the verse 5. And have you ever wondered again how this follows? Enoch preserves why. Again, we have a fall, but we have the problem of depravity that is related to this incident. Now, it seems contrived, but where does Enoch get this stuff? And here we go with Mesopotamia. There's a Mesopotamian backstory to Genesis 6, 1 through 4, the depravity of Genesis 6, 5. And this is where Annas' article that I just gave you the, the reference to, this is where he lives. He is the guy who, had, you know, again, it's a, it, it was a simple thing. He's like, you know, it's been a while since every, you know, a cuneiform person, you know, scholar, looked at all that flood stuff specifically with an eye toward the first four verses of Genesis 6. Not the flood. I mean, everybody does that. Okay, you know, connections between Mesopotamian flood stories and biblical flood stories. I mean, they've been doing that since the late 1800s, okay? But what about the first four verses? I'm going to go back and look at the cuneiform material and just see, you know, what's there. And, and his article tells you what's there. Every element is there. 
Again, there's Anas' article. The story is the story of a group called the Upkalu. And it establishes the concept. And by the way, since it was Anas who, who deserves credit for ferreting this stuff out, his material was published in 2010. I've said this on my blog and I'll say it here. All Genesis commentaries written before 2010 and even after that do not interact with Anas' study are by definition obsolete on this passage. You either interact with the material or you don't. And, you know, it's, it's only been 2010 that somebody did the grunt work to do this. So, you know, we can give a pass to older commentators, but you can't give a pass now because the job of scholars is supposed to be to keep up with this stuff. So if you're not doing it, you're either negligent or you don't want your readers to see it. You got one of two choices and neither of them are very good. It's either, it's either incompetence or malice. You know, take your pick. Okay. Now, the Apkalu, again, are divine beings. And so there's, there's really no doubt that the sons of God are going to be divine beings. So here we go. This is the entry from DDD, which was actually published before 2010, but it's nowhere near as detailed as Anna's. This entry describes the Apkalu as the culture heroes from before the flood in, in Mesopotamian thinking. Now, that term culture heroes means this. The Mesopotamians believed that the Apkalu were these supernatural beings that deserved credit for helping the Mesopotamians to develop their civilization. They gave them knowledge to become great. Okay, that's what a culture hero is in academia. See, I'm, I'm the academies translator here. They're the culture heroes from before the flood in the service of Ea, a variety of wisdom traditions from the antediluvian, that means before the flood. A variety of wisdom traditions from the antediluvian period were supposedly passed on by the Apkalu. Again, this is Mesopotamian theology, if you will. They are referred to as seven sages. They were created in the river. The Akkadian term is actually the Abzu, the abyss. That might become important later on. <laughs> That's where they're created. And they served as those who ensured the correct functioning of the plans of heaven and earth. In other words, they were pretty smart. They knew lots of stuff. Following the example of Ea, who is the god of wisdom in the Mesopotamian pantheon, they taught mankind wisdom, social forms, craftsmanship, you know, basically what, what you need to have a civilization. So they, in Mesopotamian thinking, these are, these are good guys. These are wonderful guys. I mean, they helped us become as great as we are. The gods gave us our civilization, in effect. The Apkala then were the wise divine beings from the watery abyss, the underworld, the place opposite the heavens, in Mesopotamian religion, they were responsible for maintaining the correct balance between heaven and earth. That was the will of the greater gods, which of course sets the stage for, well, what if they do something that puts it out of balance? The Apkalu possessed knowledge from the divine world that made heaven and earth tick. Before the flood, they gave knowledge to humans to civilize them. Now this was important to the scribes of Babylon living after the flood because the scribes were the ones who inherited this stuff. And so the question naturally arose, well, where did you get it? Where did you get it? And, and the scribes said, well, we got it from the Apkalu. And people would say, well, then wait a minute. There was a flood, you know, and, and, and like, how did that work? So, so they're asking the same question in Mesopotamia. It's really interesting as a little bit of sidebar. If you actually go to the Mesopotamian text, and, and Anas does a nice job of this, and you look at the specifics of what Enoch says the Watchers taught, and then you look at the areas of expertise of the Apkalu, guess what? They align. What a coincidence. Babylonians, of course, looked at this quite differently than Jews did. The scribes took great pains to establish the notion that their knowledge was directly inherited from the gods. See, that's why you should listen to us because we get our knowledge from the gods. That's, that's where our authority comes from. The problem, of course, is the, is the flood. So, you know, how, how does this work? How did the knowledge of the pre-flood Apkalu survive the flood? There are Mesopotamian texts. Again, one of the more important here is the, the, the poem of Era, the Era epic. But there are Mesopotamian tablets, and Anas again has all this, that list seven pre-flood kings 
and just a you know, list of kings, each of them accompanied by an assisting Apkalu, the divine sage who gave the king the knowledge necessary for civilization, of course, to rule. After the flood, there are four post-flood Apkalu mentioned, and they are described as being of human descent. Now, before the flood, they're not described that way. Before the flood, they're completely divine. They're, they're, they're supernatural beings. After the flood, well, they're, they're also of human descent. The fourth post-flood Apkalu is further described as being only two-thirds Apkalu. He's a hybrid, again, to use a kind of a clunky word. But that's, that's what the tablets have. These two elements, divine beings now of human descent and only two-thirds Apkalu, are important for the specific reason we'll get into in a moment. For now, the implication of these sources is that the post-flood Apkalu were the result of interbreeding with human women, the same sort of description in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. Now, Annas was not the first scholar to note this, this particular point. Anne Kilmer has a, an important article. It's in a, a feshrift to Francis Anderson down here. Here's the citation. Uh, I'm not able to post this one on my site, again, for copyright reasons. Uh, humans and Apkalu could presumably mate, since we have a description of the four post-flood Apkalu as of human descent. The fourth being only two-thirds Apkalu as opposed to pre-flood, pure Apkalu, and subsequent human sages. After the flood, the, the totally human sages are called by this term, the Umani. So we've got divine Apkalu before the flood. After the flood, we've got kind of, you know, two-thirds and one-third, or you know, hybrid Apkalu. They're also of human descent. And they're different than the humans that would come later who don't have, you know, this situation going on. Back to the, four, the fourth one, the two-thirds up Kahlo. It's really interesting that this description, being two-thirds divine, is the same description given to Gilgamesh, who is called Lord of the Apkalu in one existing cuneiform text. Gilgamesh was also a giant. Like, seriously? I mean, you, you see what's happening here. All of the elements are emerging from this story. Gilgamesh was a giant in Mesopotamian text. He's also mentioned by name in the Dead Sea Scrolls Book of the Giants. What a coincidence. Hello, how do you like that? The apparent mating with humans displeased Marduk in the, in the Mesopotamian story. Marduk doesn't like this. Because if you remember the Mesopotamian flood story, you know, some of the, the higher up gods are like disturbed from their sleep by humans. I don't know. It's just, they're just kind of a pain. Let's destroy them all. And so the gods get together and say, yeah, you know, I'd like a few more hours in it every night. So like, let's get rid of them. And so that's what they decide. Now the Apkalu hear about this and it's like, good grief, man. We, we put a lot of work into these people. It's terrible. We got to do something to make sure that our work survives. And so they do what they do and you get the, the hybrid Apkalu situation going on. And Marduk hears about it and he's like, oh, that ticks me off. Don't you realize where you're at in the pecking order here? You do what I say, not the other way around. You don't circumvent what we're trying to do here. So what Marduk does is he judges the Apkalu by sending them back to the abyss never to return. Does that sound a little bit like getting sent into the abyss, into Tartarus? and chained in gloomy darkness until the time of the end. Here's a summary. Pre-flood Apkalu were wholly divine. Post-flood Apkalu are of human descent. They dispense divine knowledge to humans, which is, in, to, to the Jews, this was horrible because it produces depravity and idolatry. To the Mesopotamians, this is like, man, you guys are awesome. Because even though the, the higher up gods wanted to wipe us out, some of us survive. And, and your knowledge that helped us build civilization survives too. You guys get two thumbs up. So the Mesopotamians viewed the Apkalu positively. The higher gods, again, don't. They sentence, you know, Marduk sentenced the Apkalu to the abyss. They are kicked out of the divine council. They're rebels. They are in a state of rebellion now. Every element of Genesis 6, 1 through 4 is accounted for. Gilgamesh is the key connection, who is specifically referenced in the Book of the Giants at Qumran and, and a few other places. So what's the point? Mesopotamian religion, Apkalu, were, were wonderful. They were the reason for Babylon's greatness. 
for the reason Babylon is the top of the heap. In Israel, that's not really good news. There are two things that are the problem. One is you've got the giant clans, okay, and the, the physical result of this, again, however this works, I'm not a deity, so I don't know, is that we have, a, we have rival people groups running around now, and ultimately in the biblical story, they're gonna be the ones that confront the Israelites in their quest for their homeland. And as I detail an unseen realm, <clears throat> it's my view that the details of the conquest tell us that the, the, the harem, the devoting to destruction concept, the devoting, to, the, the devoting to destruction thrust of the conquest is specifically aimed at eliminating the Anakim who are the descendants of the Nephilim, according to Numbers 13, 32, and 33. There are a number of reasons why I say that. The conquest narrative begins with the Anakim, who are, again, the descendants of the Nephilim, according to the biblical text, anyway. They're the ones that are spotted by the spies. The spies come back and say, man, we love this place, but guess what? Let's just turn around and run because we're like dog meat. You know, we're, gonna get, <laughs> we're just going to get our butts kicked here because they're huge. They're a whole lot bigger than we are. And that leads to God's punishment of the 70 years wandering. They come back, and God sends them up the Transjordan. Well, why does God do that? Well, he tells you in Deuteronomy 2 and 3. He tells Moses and Joshua, now look, you got to go up the other side, and you leave the Ammonites alone, you leave the Moabites alone, because the descendants of Esau, who is also related to Abraham, the descendants of Esau have already eliminated the giant clans in their regions. They're known as the Amim, the Zamzumim, the Zeus. Just leave them alone. Job, that, that job's taken care of already. But you got to go up to Bashan because there's still a few of them there. Og of Bashan. Okay, Sion and Og, kings of the Amorites, which is an important term in the narrative. Og is a giant. He is described as the last of the Rephaim. But if you go to Amos 2, 9, and 10, when he describes the conquest, he uses the word Amorite and says, they were tall as cedars. It's not a coincidence. The Anakim, Rephaim, sentence of the Neph, all this stuff. So Moses and Joshua have to go up there and take care of business in the Transjordan. Then God says, now you come down, you cross into the land in the middle, you know, the divide and conquer strategy. And at that point, when you get the battles, the kerem verb and the verbs of killing, the verbs of annihilation, occur in battles in places where the Anakim are said to live in the conquest narrative. I don't think that's a coincidence. Because at the end of the conquest in Joshua 11, how does Joshua define victory? There are no more Anakim in the land, except for the ones that escaped and got away and they went to the Philistine cities, Gath and Ashdod. And where do we encounter the rest of them later? Goliath and his brothers. This is where they're from. The goal, now there's a lot of people killed because it's not like you can blow a whistle and say, okay, like separate your Anakim here. And, you know, the rest of you, I mean, there are other verbs of conquest in, in Joshua. Dispossess, drive them out, you know, that, that are not verbs of killing. But the killing nomenclature occurs in passages, in places, cities and regions, especially the hill country, where the Anakim are said to live among the population. Now the, popu the general population is fighting for their homeland. You know, we get that. But, but the cherem, to devote to destruction, God is claiming the life of this thing, or the Anakim. You know, it, it, you'll never see that if you're not pre, if, if, you're, if you're debunking Genesis 6, 1 through 4. You'll never see that. Because you, you want to say the Anakim or something other than what the text has. They're always described as unusual. And I don't think we're talking 10, 12, you know, 30 feet high. I mean, Goliath himself, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls, was six foot six inches tall. Maybe six nine, depending on what cubit you're using. Masoretic text has him, has him taller, but the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls have him at six six. That is significant if the average human male, going by skeletons that have been excavated, in the Second Temple period, or not the Second Temple, the Old Testament period, second millennium, is about five and a half feet tall. If you're five and a half feet tall, go visit, you know, Go visit a basketball game, go to the NBA, and then you, you know, 
I mean, if, if you're running into pockets of these people, and they're trained warriors, you're just a bunch of escapees from Egypt, okay? And they've got walled cities. It's like, what are you going to think? Well, if you're Joshua and Caleb, you think, Red Sea, no problem. Okay? If you're everybody else, you think, where else can we live? Okay, this is just not going to go well. And, of course, they pay the price for that. You know, so we've got that plan, but the worst of it is the corruption of humanity. That is a, is a problem. I mean, the, the, the Anakim stuff, the Nephilim, that's taken care of during the days of David. But this is not. This persists, and this becomes a huge focus of Second Temple writing. The fact that humanity is so bad, in part, because supernatural intelligences taught us to destroy ourselves and led us away from the true God. That has to be fixed. The Messiah is supposed to fix three things, not just one. See, we're taught, again, that the only the reason why the world is the way it is is the fall, because that's the only one that we accept as rational. Again, that's just as non-rational as anything, and I, you know, all the, the core documents of Christianity. If you asked a, a, you know, an Israelite, second century or second temple period Jew, why is the world such a mess? You, three reasons, the fall. And what's the problem, what, what's the, problem the Messiah needs to cure at the fall? The death problem. You're no longer going to have everlasting life. You're under the curse of death. So the Messiah needs to fix the death problem. Genesis 6, 1 through 4, well, all that funky Anakim, Nephilim stuff, David took care of that. And again, isn't it nice that David is the prototype, you know, the dynastic prototype and producer of the Messiah? David took care of that. But the Messiah who comes needs to address human depravity. By the way, how does he do that? The Holy Spirit. Jesus says several times, I have to go so that the Holy Spirit can come and reside within you. That is the, the blunting of depravity, the presence of the Spirit in the life of the believer. And Paul says on two occasions, the Lord, who is the Spirit. I mean, the Spirit is, again, it's just like Jesus and God. Jesus is but isn't God. He is God, but he's not the Father. The Spirit is but isn't Jesus. Well, he's, he's separate and distinct. He's a person within the Trinity, but... You know, he's also in some way Jesus and God. You know, it, it all works together. And Paul on two occasions refers to the Lord who is the Spirit. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Where two or three are gathered, I am in their midst. Gathered in my name, they're believers. It's the Spirit. So the Messiah is supposed to fix that. And the third thing the Messiah is supposed to fix is the third rebellion which is Babel, the disinheritance, the divorcing of the nations. The nations need to be brought back into the family of God through the seed of Abraham, who is Jesus. It's a coherent, comprehensive plan. It's three-faceted, not just one. But you'll never see the other two because we demythologize our Bible. That's why. So, you know, the Jews are thinking, they're thinking all that. And it's like, man, the Messiah needs to fix, just he's got a huge mass ahead of him, you know? So we, we understand, again, the context for Genesis 6, 5. And what we need to do is we need to read Genesis 6, 1 through 4 as a polemic response to the Mesopotamian theology of the day. No, the Apkalu are not good guys, and their transgression of heaven and earth was not a good thing. It led potentially to our annihilation as a people, because of all you know, the Nephilim stuff. And it corrupted us. It made humanity wicked. It drove humanity away from the true God. It's not good. So you Mesopotamians out there, think what you will, okay? But the biblical writers are writing their own, again, primeval history, all the way up you know, to Abraham, and then it, you know, everything else runs from there. And they want you to know that this episode, I mean, who, who is Israel? I mean, they're going to they're be, these other nations are going to wipe their feet on Israel. So the, God wants people to know through the biblical writers that, look, you're going to hear that the reason that you're beaten, the reason that you are just inferior to these people is because of their gods, and specifically in Babylon, which is where the whole, the Old Testament story ends, you're going to hear that the reason for Babylon's superiority is that they, they are empowered by their gods. This is the reason why they're great. This is the reason why Babylon is incomparable. This is the reason why we conquered you. You're going to hear all that stuff. 
But we want you to know okay, what the real story is and who's really in control. And this is why these four kind of you know, funky verses are there. It's part of a theology to help the, belief of the family of Yahweh cope with their circumstances and their history. It's, a, it's part of a theological response. Again, that's the, the end of what we'll do here. But again, we have lost this, essentially. Um, you know, part of the, the whole the, the whole watcher thing, it leaks into the New Testament. I'm not going to go through reverse and Hermon here because you know, there's, there's, I don't know what, if we have a lunch prepared or what, what's going on. Or Q&A. Um, but there are all sorts of ways that this idea that the Messiah has to fix this, you know, three problems, but in reverse in Hermon, I zero in this middle one, this, this, this whole Genesis 6 problem. There are a number of, of things that you'll, if you know the story, you'll read in the New Testament and go, oh, okay, I know what he's tracking on here. I'll give you one example. I, I, uh, this is, it's probably four years ago now. I was at SBL, which is the Society of Biblical Literature. And it's not an evangelical group. It's just, you know, anybody who does biblical studies in the world. So I'm going through the program. And some of you who listen to the podcast have heard of David Burnett. You know, Burnett's with me sitting and we're going through the program. And I saw a paper by a guy named Tyler Stewart, who was at the time a doctoral student at Marquette, which is where Burnett is now. And <laughs> the title was something like Bastard Spirits, The Watchers, and the birth of the Son of God. And now, bastard spirits is what the Dead Sea Scrolls refer to. That's another term they use for the watchers because they're hybrid. And we looked at each other and it's like, we are going to be in that room. Okay? We are not going to miss this paper. Because I don't know what this guy's going to do. But he's, you know, we read the abstract. He's going to go through Galatians 3 and 4. It's like, I'm not missing that one. And it was awesome. What, what he does, and again, I incorporate this in, in reverse in Hermon. He, got, he went to Galatians 3 to start. And there's that familiar line that the law was added because of transgressions. Plural. See, we're trained to think that the law was added because of what Adam and Eve did. and all. You know. It's plural. And he said, now, we're just going to do a little thought experiment today. And it, it was more than that, but that he was prepping us. He said... What if the law was added because of transgressions? Just whose transgressions are we talking about? What if it's the transgressions of the watchers? I wonder if any second temple authors thought that. And then he just dumped on us. <laughs> and it's like, holy cow, like, like I didn't realize that there it is. And it was just unbelievable. And then he tied it to the timing of the birth of the Son of God. And it was like, oh boy, I gotta get this paper. You know, what, what do I have to do to wrestle this from your hands? You know? um, and he was nice enough to give me the paper. But there are just things like that, that second temple period writers, they thought about that line, that idea, quite differently than we do. And if, when, when you get into that literature, you see that that ain't the only place. There are things just dropped here and there in the New Testament that you know, link back into not only Second Temple literature generally, but link back into this story in all sorts of really interesting ways. And this is why yesterday when we talked about Enoch, look, it doesn't matter what status you assign or don't assign to the book of Enoch. What matters is that you, you become familiar with material that the biblical writers read because they're going to be responding to things. They're going to be dropping stuff. They assume that their audience will, again, pick up what they're laying down. They assume a familiarity that we just don't have. So it takes us work to, to recapture that. And, but you can do it. Again, I'm going to, I'm going to close with, with this, a little part of my own testimony. And I told you yesterday, when, when I became a believer, I basically didn't know anything. I, you know, my, my, my parents got divorced when I was five. My brother was three. My mom had to go out and, you know, work like single moms do. And even when she got remarried, you know, 
<clears throat> my dad was an alcoholic, and so he couldn't keep a job. So my mom has to work all the time. And so we got shipped to my grandma's a lot. And my grandma lived next door to a family, single mom again, with four kids. Two of them had cystic fibrosis. I don't know how she made it. Because they, I mean, they just struggled mightily. I mean, we, we had it good, like, compared to what's going on over there. So it was, but they were, they were Christians. The, the, the lady was a Christian, and her oldest son became my best friend growing up. If you've read my novels, Brian Scott, it's this kid's name. Okay, so we, I go over to his house, and they have devotions. And so I'm, I'm there. I'm either sleeping over or whatever. I'm, I'm allowed to stay. And I'm marveling, like, this kid knows. Like, what's, who's this Abraham dude? You know, I, I mean, he, I, I just thought that, like, he was just this fount of information. And he's nine. Okay? You know, it's just like, I don't know what's going on here. But it was, it was through them you know, that I, I get my first exposure to the gospel. And, you know, later on, I only really became a Christian. I really only grasped the gospel when I was 16, when we were in high school. But I really didn't know much more because I never read the Bible. I'm not over at this kid's house every day. So there I am, and so I start reading the Bible. So what I tell people, because I, I, I get it, it's like you can, look, you can listen to this stuff, you can watch the YouTube video, you know, all that stuff, listen to the podcast, and you, and you think, there is no way I'm ever going to know, know the things I want to know. I mean, it's just overwhelming. It's not overwhelming. It's overwhelming if you look at it cumulatively. Okay, I am the result of five minutes a day for a long time. I mean, if, if you learn one new thing about scripture or about some point of context, if you learn one new thing every day, in 365 days, you got a good pile. And that's one year. You have to break up the task into digestible bits. That's all I did. Now, I'll confess I was a geek. Right? You know, I... I, I couldn't, like, not do it. So I'll, I'll confess that part. But if you have enough ambition to just learn something new every day, you are going in a couple of years' time. You know, you're, you're going to be a rock star in your church. Okay? You're going to be the one that gets the questions because you're learning. You're learning. And this is why I believe, sincerely, that most pastors dramatically underestimate both the appetite and the aptitude for content. I do not have a photographic memory. I had a good memory in high school. It's the only thing I was kind of good at was school. I played sports and all that kind of stuff. But I wasn't getting any scholarships, trust me. You know, and I had no direct, I, I, could, I could regale you with ridiculous stories of how dumb I was in high school. Because I had no direction. I, nobody in my family had ever gone to college. I don't know what I'm doing. Well, I'll tell you just one, just, just to, to show you how bad it was. We go in to take our SATs. Everybody who's like going to been to high school, you got to take the SATs. So I'm like everybody else. I'm herded into this room. You put the paper down in front of you. You got a pencil. Yeah, you know, okay, take this test. Well, at the end of the test, it says you have to put a number in to get your scores sent to a college, or they won't take the test. And it's like, what do you mean you won't take the test? I'm done with it. So you got to put a number in. And I'm like, really? I'm like, I don't know. So they give you the list, you know, all these numbers of, of institutions. And I'm looking through the list. And I put the number in for the University of Kentucky. Why? Because I went to high school with Sam Bowie, who was drafted ahead of Michael Jordan. That's, that's his claim of infamy. And Sam was going to the University of Kentucky. And so I thought, well, if I go there, I'll know somebody. <laughs> that's what I did. I had no direction at all. Here, here's the test. You happy now? You know, <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. So, again, I did not go to Kentucky. Um, you know, I, I, I tell you stuff like that because you, you, you got to get away from this, this notion that this is an insurmountable mountain. It's not. You know, the dirty little secret is, is that you can actually do a lot of this stuff. Now, I'm fortunate that I work at Logos, and we, you know, we manufacture all these tools and stuff like that. You know, and, and that's why it's there. You live at a unique time. Never before, I didn't have any of this stuff going through college and graduate school. 
I didn't have software. If it existed, I couldn't afford it. To I'm putting myself through school. I mean, it just. But you have the internet. You have software. You you, you have access to an amazing amount of material. Your task, on one in that level, in terms of access, is both easier and more complex because there's just so much now. You know, but it, it's still something that's reducible to a little bit of your time every day. So don't look at this like it's just this, I'm giving up. You know, I'll read your book, but I'm out of here. You know? no, don't check out. Don't check out. Because you actually can do this. Terry, I think you're in the back. So. I'm, I'm done rambling now. So It's, it's up to him what, what he wants to do. I would encourage you, too, a good way to start would be, uh, yes, Logos Bible Software has some great classes that you can take. Razor is on several of those classes. I've taken all the classes on there that he's taught. And uh, so a lot of material that we heard today, I've heard several times because of these classes. Also, Faith Life TV has uh, has some of these free classes on there. You can go over there. So that's a good place to start, especially if you want to kind of reiterate some of the things that you've learned today. Also, the, uh, the PowerPoints that, you, that you've been watching, those will be online on our website. We'll put those on there so you'll be able to download them. And as well as the, the, the teachings that you heard. If you missed on yesterday, those will be on there. Give us a week. We'll get them up online, and they'll be there on the website. So, we are on the website. Go to uh, calvaryslc.org, the, the church website. We'll get them there. It'll be under the teaching section. Feel free to. Kim? Uh, we ended up making a podcast for more on the Salvation Yeah, I, I mean, we're, we're 230 episodes in. I don't, I'd, I'd actually have to do what, what you'd have to do. Is I'd actually have to search through Google. Uh, to find it, um, <clears throat> that there there's an there's an individual episode on the, the birth of Jesus, and you know the Revelation 12 stuff and Jewish chronology stuff, um, and we'll probably put that up again at, at Christmas time because just as a competing thing because I don't I don't think December 25th has anything to do with it. Um, yeah, that that's probably the best thing to do is is. Go to Google and put nakedbiblepodcast.com and then throw in a few search terms. You know, Jesus, birth, or you're going to find stuff like that. When it comes to salvation history, um, we, you, you could you can do the search, but put in things like Deuteronomy 32, uh, put in things like salvation, um, you know, the cross, or you know, just, just try to use keywords. Well, I don't have a, I can tell you I don't have a series on, on this kind of thing because it's like, well, I mean, essentially Unseen Realm does that. And I, I'm i not going to re- sit there and read Unseen Realm because we have an audio book for it. <laughs> so we kind of undermine that. So I, yeah, I wouldn't do that. But we, we go in and out of the book quite a bit. Um, if you go to the podcast website, again, nakedbiblepodcast.com, at the top there's something that says to the effect like, are you new, new here, you know, click here, start here first. And there are four videos. Um, two of them are, are a quick overview of what I would call the Divine Council worldview. Like one is about the heavenly host and stuff like that, Divine Council Psalm 82. And then the other one is the Deuteronomy 32 overview. So I, I put those there because when I reference it in podcasts, I may or may not give the quick summary of it. I may just say, go back and watch the video. Um, and you, you might even put in the word video you know, as, a, as a keyword search. But, but you have to include nakedbiblepodcast.com because uh, it'll, it'll search my website if you do that. Yes? Yeah, Angels is out. It was out. It, it, it shipped two days ago. So if you pre-ordered it on Amazon, it should be in the mail. Um, so that, that one, they took the, the pre-order thing off. I did check that. The Demons one, I have not been given a date for that. They've had the manuscript for about, what are we in? We're in September now. They've had it for about four months. Um, so I know it's, it's in the editorial process. I just don't know. They haven't given me a date for when that's gonna, gonna ship. I, I'm sure they'll have it you know, by, I think Christmas time would be the latest because I'm sure they'll wanna pair them like in a bundles to, to drop the cost you know, of each, but um, I don't have anything definite. Yes, sir. So um, can you help clarify something? in Isaiah because I was always saying yeah a third of the angels so when they're talking in Isaiah when he's talking about the devil being a throne 
they're with them. There's no number there, right? Yeah, I, there's no number in there in, in either Isaiah 14 or Ezekiel 28. And again, if, if you read Unseen Realm, you know, I, I know because it's obvious that those chapters are directed, they are oracles directed at respectively the king of Babylon and the prince of Tyre. That's very obvious. But what isn't obvious, and, and again, I'm not alone in this view. I'm, I'm, I'm prob it's probably still a minority view. But my, my argument is that both those two passages and Genesis 3, all of them are drawing on a story about a supernatural rebellion in the council. And that's why they share vocabulary related to the council. It's why they share casting down vocabulary. So I'm not objecting to what's obvious, that the writers are using this story of, of rebellion against the Most High as a foil to go after these kings and their arrogance. That's very obvious. But a lot of scholars resist connecting those passages. And, you know, I get into it more in angels, or specifically in the demons book, as to why I think that might be. But, you know, that's, that's the gist of it. There was a hand. Go ahead. Since I was a kid, I've always been told that when Jesus was talking to the Sadducees in Matthew 22, he was saying that in the resurrection, you'll be like the angels. Mm -hmm. You'll be neither married nor given in marriage. Mm -hmm. And it's always been put forth to me that that was talking about the angels are sexless. They don't have mm -hmm. sex. So, of course, this whole business going on in Genesis 6 has mm -hmm. nothing to do with angels coming down and having sex with women. Mm -hmm. So... What exactly was Jesus referring to? You, you, to? you actually answered your own question. Yeah, that they were just in the resurrection. In other words, in, in the supernatural world, in the new earth, you know, the resurrection state, the glorified state, all that stuff, we don't, we don't need this sort of thing. We, it, it's, it's just out of the picture. When it, they don't eat either. Do, they, do we need to eat in the resurrection? Do we need to sustain our lives? We don't need to reproduce. You know, no. But, but when angels come to earth, the required form of dress is flesh for some reason. They interact physically in other ways. You know, they, like with Lot, you know, they wrestle with Jacob. They pull Lot into the house. They have a meal. Yahweh himself is embodied, has a meal with Abraham in Genesis 18. They're, they do a number of physical things that in the resurrection or in their own realm, they don't need to do. Um, you know, we, we've just assumed that We've sort of blotted out the phrase in the resurrection and we, and we put in there at all times. And that's not what the text actually says. You know, again, there, there are plenty of people running around in the second temple period that know their Old Testament pretty well. And they're not drawing that conclusion because there's no reason to draw the conclusion. Now people ask me, well, how does that work? Again, I'm not a deity. I, I, I don't know what deities can and cannot do. Um, there's, no, there's no scriptural verse, for instance, that says a supernatural being can't willfully assume human form. We know they do, but the assumption is, well, God let them do that. You know, they raised their hand and said, we'd like to go to earth now, or God said, you need to go to earth now, change clothes. Like, like that God, if in, this, in this little incident, gives them the ability then and, then, and then the rest of the time they don't have it. All of that is just an assumption. There's no text that ever says any of that. And so what, what my propensity is, is, again, I, I'm, not, I'm not hostile to denominations, I'm not hostile to creeds or anything like that, because they, they personally serve me really well at different points in my Christian life. But I only care about what the text can sustain. I don't care about anything else, including fighting with other Christians. I just don't care. You know, it, I, unless you're adulterating the gospel, unless you're coming up with some other gospel, you're supplementing it with works or something like that. I might listen to a question, I might interact with someone, and I might be thinking, you really don't have a prayer of being right. But I'm not going to say that. It serves no useful purpose. Be warmed and filled. I, I would rather have people who are tenacious about Bible study and believe all sorts of fruit loopy things, but they get the gospel right. I'd rather have all of that than people who just don't give a rip Absolutely. in our churches. They just will not read and study the text. Give me 10 of the Fruit Loops for every one of those who are apathetic. I will take that deal all day long. You know, it, we're, we're all going to get to be wrong. We're all going to get to be right at some point. You know, but I don't, I try not to overread the text. I try to have some something in the text that either 
we, we see this data point here, we, or we don't see a data point ruled out, and there are other things around, you know, other data points in the text that make this idea you know, workable and coherent, even though I don't have a, a proof text that says it, I have other texts that make this possible, and so it stays on the table. I need a biblical reason to wipe things off, and I need a biblical reason to put things on. That's all I want. And that's the, that's the task. That's what, make, to me, that's what makes it fun. Because the, the, those kind of things are, are the things to think about. You know, and in this case, we have a massive amount of material, including Peter and Jude, who, if they're saying what they're saying, they're not reading Matthew 22 that way. Because they should have been bright enough to know that, well, I can't really say that because of this thing over here. You know, so we don't have that. And we have no, we have no scripture passage that rules it out. And so I'm content to just let it there. And I don't know how it works. Again, I, I, I don't know what it would be like to be a, a deity, a, a divine being. I don't know. I don't know what their limitations are or, or, or aren't. I, I have to look at scripture to see, and hopefully it'll, it'll whittle it away a little bit. You know, I'll get more information there. But in a lot of these things, we don't, we don't have affirmations or denials of things. You know, so, so then the question becomes, is this coherent given the, the, the set of data that we do have? Is it on the table or is it off the table? Again, I, like I said before, I, I tend to think of things pretty simplistically. And I'll, I'll grant that. But I think if, if, you, if you sort of go back to really simple core ideas and their coherence has stood the test of time, that's going to serve you well. Then you, you just accrue things. You, know, you, you study scripture and you accrue things to that. And you use those, those important points of coherence as your touch point for you know, testing ideas. I do not use tradition as my touch point for testing ideas. Again, it's not because I, I don't like it. It's just because it's, it's at a lower level. You know, you'd be surprised. I actually paid, I don't know if you've subscribed to the newsletter. It's, it's probably almost a year ago. I, I asked for part-time research assistance. You know, I, I had accumulated, like, I guess I used royalty money or something. I wanted to hire people to go through the church fathers' writings of the first eight centuries and specifically looking for divine counsel stuff. I gave them a list of verse references because in Logos, you know, we added the verse references to, to a lot of that stuff. I gave them websites where there was material that we didn't have in the software, writings of the fathers. I said, you know, read it. Don't just look up the verse references, but here's a list of keywords. I want you to read this and, and we put a specific eye toward Deuteronomy 32 stuff, Psalm 82 stuff. And, and they did that. I have, I have a lot of data to go through. I, I wanted to do that because at some point I'll probably do a paper like at ETS or something like that. You know, what were the church fathers tracking on? I hope you realize the church fathers were A, really, really intelligent, and B, really, really limited. They are centuries removed from the New Testament. They are millennia removed from the Old. I can count the number of church fathers on one hand who knew Hebrew. Now here's the thing. If we say that Hebrew is important and we make our seminarians learn Hebrew, it's still important for the church fathers. And if they don't know it, why are you trusting their exegesis? Augustine knew Greek, but he confessed he hated it. He did his work in the Vulgate. That's what he was comfortable with. He was a Latinist and, and, and an adept one. He was really good. And he's just a really smart guy. And, and all these other, I mean, these are not dumb people. They're, they're brilliant people. They do not have facility with the languages for the most part. I mean, later in the Reformation, you get Luther and Calvin. They can do some work in Hebrew. They don't have access to any of the ancient Near Eastern material because it wasn't translated yet. It only gets translated in the, in the 1800s. They don't have any comparative material. They don't have the Dead Sea Scrolls. That's a mid-20th century discovery. Ugaritic is, a, is an early 20th century discovery. They don't have half or a third, maybe even a quarter of what you have. They don't have it. They are limited. As brilliant as they are, they are limited. So they're useful, but we have to, we have to sort of set them in context. You know, we, we have to tap them for what, you know, what they're tracking on, and, and, and they are tracking on a number of really interesting things. But we also have to realize sort of where they fit in terms of, of the task of exegesis. And if, if we really, 
unless we want to just pay lip service to interpreting in context. You know, if you're not willing, like I said, if you're not willing to, to look at Genesis 6 in light of the Akalu story and, you know, the era epic and all that kind of stuff, if you're not willing to do that, fine. But I don't ever want to hear you talk to me about interpreting the Bible in context again. And I have said that to people, you know, winning hearts and minds everywhere I go. Okay, but, but, I, but I'm serious about it. Because why are you talking about this and then denying it in your procedure? Why? It just, I mean, don't, don't be afraid. It's just your Bible. I mean, it, you know, why are you doing that? So, again, I'm not like, I'm not, you know, it's a pretty small list of what I'm anti, okay? But we have to both honor these guys for what they achieved with the tools that they had, but also realize their limitations and, you know, not beat them up for it, but, but realize that, you know, if they had what I had, boy, they'd do a whole lot better, you know? It's, it's, it's unfortunate that, that it's me instead of Calvin. I mean, Calvin's like a Bible calculator. I mean, it's just, I mean the guy doesn't even have a concordance. I and mean, if you read the Institutes, that, that would astound you. You know, tremendous intellects, but yet, again, very limited in what they have access to, to do their work. So, yeah. so God, we've got to come up. So, uh, what a blessing to have at the high school. So, yeah. what a blessing. <laughs> Yeah, that's <laughs> I need to talk to you afterwards. Well, we'll pray, and then uh, and if you want to give, and do a blessing to our brothers, just write on a check or put it in a little box for the church. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for just the blessing of the last day and today, Lord.